Bayern Munich midfielder Marcel Sabitzer is travelling to Manchester to finalise a loan move to Manchester United. Chelsea locked in negotiations over a British record fee for Benfica midfielder Enzo Fernandez. Good evening. We've been looking forward to this, oh, haven't we? Yeah, a very yeah. warm welcome to deadline day with Manchester United and Chelsea both looking to seal late deals with... Just look over your head, Vicky. Uh, just under three hours remaining in this transfer window. Yeah, I'm so sure. Uh, we will also be live to Old Trafford as well in just a few moments as Eric Ten Hag looks for emergency cover after a long-term injury to Christian Eriksen. Arsenal have also been making moves as we await confirmation of Jorginho swapping west for North London. Plenty of deals are already done, including Jack Cancelo, who's been <laughs> falling out with Pep Guardiola, but he's denied it. <laughs> Plus there's live football as well tonight. Newcastle and Southampton just kicking off in their Carabao Cup semi-final second leg. A place at Wembley is on the line for them both. We will keep you right up to date with events from that semi-final at St James's Park. Yeah, a very warm welcome to you and a very warm welcome to all of our guests here in the studio. Well, it's got a feeling of deadline day soccer special mashup for you tonight because there is that semi-final. Michael Dawson is the man in the hot seat. You're going to keep us up to date on Newcastle uh, against Southampton. And of course, we've got Sue Smith, Chris Boyd and Clinton Morrison. We've got the team back together from the, the summer transfer window. Uh, it's great to have you uh, all with us uh, this evening. Uh, we are waiting for news on Arsenal and um, a move for Jorginho from Chelsea. It's the news we got last night that he could be making the move from uh, Stamford Bridge to the Emirates. And there is news we can bring you. We can start this evening with breaking news from Gail Davis, who is at the Emirates. What can you tell us, Gail? Well, it's a deal that we've been talking about since the early hours of this morning. Jorginho is now an Arsenal player. I'm just quickly scrolling through because, of course, he's done his interview on the club website. So I uh, haven't had a chance to actually listen to that and get you some quotes yet. But we saw him a little bit earlier with his agent, didn't we? In his Arsenal kit, his Arsenal socks and confirmation from the club. Uh, an 18-month deal with the option of an extra year as well. I remember last six months of his contract with Chelsea. So it's a fee of around £12 million. And Mikel Arteta has talked a lot in the last few weeks. He wanted to strengthen that midfield position we know how well Thomas Partey and Granit Xhaka have done in that central midfield role. But we also know that uh, Mohamed Elneny has picked up a serious injury. Confirmed today he'd had an operation on his knee and they desperately needed cover there. It wasn't perhaps the midfielder many Arsenal fans thought they would get. Remember Moises Casido was, uh, was told by Brighton that he wouldn't be leaving and Arsenal had hands off. But they have got themselves a new midfielder for the run-in this season and uh, that huge amount of experience that he brings as a Euros winner and uh, as a Champions League winner as well will no doubt help Arteta, who's a, a big fan of his, uh, try to sign him um, uh, Arsenal tried to sign him back in 2020 and when Arteta was part of Manchester City's coaching back in 2018 as well. So they have a midfielder in their ranks on deadline day. Well, thank you very much indeed. So that is the breaking news. Jorginho is uh, an Arsenal player signing from Chelsea this evening. Let's see what our, our panel make of that. Um, Sue, I'm going to start with you because I've heard a lot of negativity uh, from the Arsenal section on, on this signing today. It's £12 million that they were expecting Caicedo. They've got Jorginho. C can you understand that uh, rather lukewarm reaction to this? No, I, I think it's a great signing. Um, I think it's a position that Arsenal needed to strengthen. They wanted to strengthen. I think with obviously El Nenny with the injury. Um, we don't know how long Partey is going to be out, but I think they wanted to strengthen in that area anyway. Um, so whether the Arsenal fans, they, I suppose they wanted Casado, they, they were seeing that this could potentially be a deal. Brighton said, no, he's not for sale. Um, but I just think Jorginho, I think with his experience, I think his leadership, the fact that he's a, he's a winner, he's brilliant on the ball, and you just think... 
you know, he's, he's got that calmness, that composure, get on the ball, and he can feed the likes of Martinelli and Saka. I think what some of the Arsenal fans have, have said is he might slow the game down yeah. and Arsenal don't play that way. But I, I just think he's a top quality player mm. that would, he can adapt to, you know, sort of any team that, that he goes to. So I think, it's a, I think it's a great signing for him. Chris, when he's on the pitch, does he change the way Arsenal play? Will, will he slow them down? No. I mean, I, I think good players will sense the moment when they do need to take the, <coughs> put their foot in the ball and, and take the sting out of the game um, or there is time for the knee up it. Go. There you go, do you want to? Sorry. Well, I tell you what, we are updating the game. Should, should we yeah, give the, hold your thought? Hold your thought on that. Uh, there is an early goal to tell you about, though, in this Carabao Cup semi-final. Remember, Newcastle led one 0 from the first leg. Early goal at St James's Park. Newcastle don't ever concede there. Have they conceded tonight, though, Michael? No, they haven't. Four minutes into the game, Jules, it's a great goal. Newcastle has been one way traffic. Long staff, the short yeah. is going ballistic. Long staff. He doesn't get many goals. He's been a unsung hero for Newcastle this year. He comes down the right. Trippier does magnificent. He chops inside, Kyle Walker Peters in, he just let, lends it to Longstaff, he takes it through <laughs> his right foot and he sends it straight across Gavin Bazuno. He has no chance. A great bit of play from down the left hand side and he served it all the way across from uh, Ramirez into Longstaff, down to Trippier. He chops inside, probably send him outside. One touch puts it in Gavin Bazuno's bottom right hand corner. 2 0 up in the time, 1 0 on the night. Is that going to be the goal that sends him to the final? Time will tell. Well, that was great information. I don't know how much of it you heard at home because we've got a few mic issues and Michael well, Dawson. Well, I, I kept you going. I could have stopped you, but I kept you going. You've ever been in there. The viewers are delighted it's no space on. <laughs> For those who couldn't hear, it, it was Newcastle. It's Longstaff who's got it, and they are now firmly in control of this semi final. 2 0. Uh, they lead, they lead on aggregate. Hey, I don't know if you can still hear it, but it's 2 0. Um, uh, Chris, we stopped to and you were telling us about Jorginho. I mean, you're saying that good players can, can adapt to different teams. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is the case with Jorginho. We've seen it I mean, two years ago. We're talking about him the running for the Ballon d'Or, um, and you know he has started the last few Chelsea games as well. Um, it's a very good sign for me for, for Arsenal. I think obviously it's Sue touched on the injuries there, um, but it's not only that. I mean, we speak, we always speak about Arsenal in terms of you know how youthful they are. Um, you can't beat experience and bringing somebody like Georgina in will help you know the youngsters around him um, as I said he is a winner as Sue touched on there he is a winner he knows how um, you know to lead um, and uh, for me I think it's a, it's a fantastic signing and I'm sure he'll do really well and what 12 million pounds mm. it's a good bit of business I mean Clinton we know that Chelsea are making lots of signings still looking to strengthen before we, before we close tonight with, with Enzo Fernandez. even with Fernandez coming in uh, are you a bit surprised that they've, they've let someone with such experience go can you hear me? I think we can. <laughs> oh, Sadly, yours is working. Yeah. I don't even. Need, I don't even need the mic. Well, I thought so that. Clint, I don't you. need it. But no, nah, I was surprised. But at the end of the day, Fernandez comes in. Probably long-term plan. Jorginho don't fit into that long-term plan. He's going to sign a year and a half deal at Arsenal. Listen, at first, I was one of those thinking, really, do Arsenal need him? But you know what? They are in this Premier League title race. They've got a great opportunity. With 10 games to go, they've got a lot of youngsters in there. They've got a serial winner in Jorginho. He'll take the ball, slow it down, and he'll also cause a lot of problems. And he'll be brilliant in, he'll be brilliant in there. And it's not every game Partey and Xhaka can play together. So having some of the experience like Jorginho has won a lot of things. I think it's a good signing. But I was one of those probably at the beginning thinking, did they really need him? They've gone, we're going for Casado, a young 21-year-old who can get around the pitch. But Jorginho has got experience. And you've got to realise, I heard earlier, um, Jules, what Merce was saying he made a good point at the Euros he was one of Italy's best players and everyone was saying we need to England sorry England need to develop a young player like Jorginho he's an outstanding footballer I think it's a, a great bit of business from Arsenal uh, just to bring a couple of um, quotes from the uh, the Arsenal uh, hierarchy which, which really sum up exactly what you've heard from our panel Edu the sporting director uh, saying that Jorginho is an established professional a strong mentality he brings quality and experience into our squad a player who fits our style of play says Edu, Edu and he joins at a very good moment where he can contribute in a key position to help maintain our momentum. Uh, Mikel Arteta, the manager, saying he's a midfield player with intelligence, deep leadership skills and a huge amount of Premier League and international experience too. He's won in his career, but he still has the hunger and huge willingness to contribute here. So there we go. That is Jorginho, uh, a £12 million move. He is now an Arsenal player, having left Chelsea. Uh, Vicky, I think I'm coming to you, aren't we? Busy old start. Yeah, and then it could have been 2-0 on the night. Oh, right, Doss. Sorry. Did you not hear? They're closing in Did on you not hear Let's cross live to the club's training ground. Join Ben Ransom, who's there for us. And Ben, 
<laughs> you were there all day. You were the one that posed that question to Eric Ten Hag. Are you going to do anything about this injury to Christian Eriksen? He kind of alluded that he wasn't, and then everything just changed, didn't it? So where are we with this man coming in the door? Well, the exciting news in the last few minutes is that where we are is that Marcel Sabitzer is on the ground. He's landed in Manchester and we understand he is in a convoy of cars on his way to, we hope, uh, the training ground here at Carrington. So we're expecting to see him possibly in the next 15 or 20 minutes arriving here. The deal has happened at a real pace, hasn't it, ever since Eric Ten Hag and Manchester United got that news about him coming. So we're expecting him here in the next five minutes. Look forward to that very shortly. Thank you very much. Back to you very shortly indeed. Just a reminder of the breaking news in the last few minutes that Jules brought you at the top of the show. Jorginho is an Arsenal player coming out. We will be live to his former club, Chelsea, for the latest on their hunt for Enzo Fernandez.
Uh, let's bring you some um, breaking news. It's an update on Manchester United target Marcel Sabitza. Uh, the move has got ever closer because he has landed in Manchester in the last few minutes. Marcel Sabitza, uh, United pushing to sign him on loan before the transfer deadline. Sky Germany are reporting the deal is close now and it will include an option to buy the Austrian international from Bayern Munich. This was him earlier on uh, leaving Germany. Sky Germany's camera operator in the right place at the right time to get mm -hmm. a glimpse of him preparing to board the, the plane. He has now landed on UK soil and is uh, heading to uh, Manchester United offices to push through that deal, a loan deal we expected to be with the option to buy uh, from Bayern Munich. And all this happening, of course, uh, let's put it to our guest and, uh, and discuss this. Um, we have a little game of uh, musical chairs, by the way. Uh, Clinton wasn't happy with where he was sat. <laughs> no, no. Uh, last, last time I was on that, it was a brilliant show. So you're feeling uncomfortable now? Yeah, so if we get one-word answers, you know what? The yin and the yang's all over the place. Yeah, all over. You'll be fine. OK. Uh, well, let's start with you, Clinton. I mean, the, the reason they're bringing Sabitzer in on deadline yeah, day yeah. is because Christian Eriksen, we got the news earlier, yeah. that he's out till possibly May with this yeah, injury. Yeah, I mean, firstly on him, how big a hole does that leave in, in, in the United Oh, it's a huge loss. I think him and Casemiro in there have been outstanding. When a lot of raised eyebrows when Eriksen went into Man United, he's been exceptional. He's been one of their best players alongside Casemiro. Yeah, you can bring Fred in there, you can bring Matt Tomine, but he's a huge blow because not only his defensive work, but it's his, his passing forward. The way he can pick a pass, eye of a needle pass, he's been brilliant for the likes of Rashford and Bruno Fernandes. So it's going to be a huge blow because you want to see Christian Eriksen on the football pitch. But yeah, Man United oh. have acted real, um, real quickly, but it's, it's going to be a huge blow, Jules, because he is a very talented individual, Eriksen. If they get Sabitza, Sue, uh, he was at Leipzig, wasn't he? He's been, he's been at Bayern Munich. It's not really worked there for him, though, has it? No, it hasn't. Um... But I think because of the Ericsson injury, obviously, then Manchester United have had to go, right, OK, we need to, to bring in um, another midfielder. And, you know, he's, he's got good Champions League experience. Um, he, it was quite interesting because I had a look how many games he's played for, for Bayern. And he, he had actually played 40 games, but like you say, it hadn't quite worked out for him. I think at Leipzig showed what a, a top quality player that he can be. I think there's goals there, there's assists there. So, um, yeah, he's got good pedigree, uh, lots of caps for Austria as well. So I think that's, you know, probably where Ten Hag's looked at and, and thought, OK, well, we need to, we need to mm. certainly fill a gap. They, um, they, you know what? So they needed to act because McTominay is injured. He's out for a couple well, of yeah. weeks. So you've only got... Um, then Fred can come in and play against Casemiro. So if you look to your bench, what other midfielder can you have to come in? So Bitsa is a good signing. I've, I see a lot of him at RB Leipzig. He was really talented. That's why a lot of the big clubs were looking at him. Goretzka and Ki, um, Kimmich are keeping him out. They're two outstanding midfielders. So there's... <laughs> wouldn't rub your nose up if, if them two are keeping you out because yeah. they're two talented individuals. I think it would be a good signing for Man United. Very knowledgeable. Who? Very knowledgeable. Even in German football, mate. I know everything. That's why they get me on here. <laughs> Very knowledgeable. <laughs> Thank you. I, I mean, Chris, well, Chris, show us your knowledge now. Um, <laughs> I mean, Jamie O'Hara heard him earlier on, on the programme earlier in the afternoon saying that he thought if they don't replace... Eric's in today, they can forget about the top. Got to put Jimmy Harden knowledgeable in the same sentence there. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> if they Chris. don't rep replace him today, then they can forget about top four without Ericsson in well, the I team. Mean, I think there's been a lot made out of, of you know, <coughs> Ericsson and, and rightly so because of you know, he's, he's moved since he's, he's went. Um, he's been outstanding. Um, and I think it's really important here and don't compare the two players. To, you know, they're yeah. two different players. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you know, Manchester United are going to get somebody totally different to um, Christian Eriksen, what he does. Um, you know, he will, he will get in the box. He will try to create um, opportunities, as, as Sue touched on there. Um, he scored goals before at RB Leipzig. He's a threat. Um, and I think that the, the key thing here is, you know, it's another body for Manchester United because <coughs> there's no doubt they do need it. The injuries are there. And they've shown... You know, in the recent, well, since the World Cup break, they're in this for the long haul. Yeah. Um, they're going in the right direction. Um, a lot of people have raised a few eyebrows at a few of their transfers, but they seem to have come off. And um, I think the way that Ten Hag is going about his business, yes, there's a lot of the bigger ones making bigger you know, signings or more household names, but you, you wouldn't be surprised if this is another one where he comes in, hits the ground running, and um, you know, is a big... Um, has a big say, you know, between now and the end of the season for Manchester United. He's in Manchester. We'll keep an eye on him and let you know when there's any more to tell you on Sabitzer to Manchester United. Uh, a midfielder is what they want. A midfielder is what Arsenal wanted today. And as we told you at the top of the hour, they've got their man, Jorginho, completing his move uh, from Chelsea to Arsenal. And these, the first images in reaching us from uh, Arsenal uh, arriving, striding into Arsenal earlier on, meeting some of his uh, new teammates as well. He is now an Arsenal player, swapping West
London for North London and there he is with his new number 20 shirt flanked by his new manager Mikel Arteta and Edu on the, the right. Well, I saw was getting quite a lot of stick on social media, Edu, the sporting director, earlier on today. Edu out was trending, which uh, confused a lot of us, I think, given where Arsenal are on the table and the success of some of the signings they've had. But there is Jorginho, now an Arsenal player. That's one of those that, for me, might take a while to see him in the red shirt. So used to seeing him in the blue of Chelsea, but he is now an Arsenal player. Speaking of the blue of Chelsea, Vicky. Oh, the blue of Vicky. Thank you very much. No, because we're going to talk about Chelsea, quite frankly. Uh, of course, they've been the busiest, haven't they, in this window. And they have just over two and a half hours to finalise this British transfer record deal for Enzo Fernandez. They may have saved the best till last. And Paul Gilmore is there waiting. Paul Gilmore, even, even um, is waiting at Stamford Bridge. I think we've had a goal. We'll go back to that in just a minute. But you're at Stamford Bridge. You've been there a long time, Paul. How further... Is this deal ahead? Are they still confident of getting this done? Well, there is still a, a quiet confidence, Vicky, that there is time to get uh, this, what would be a British transfer record, done. You talked about Jorginho there. Jorginho's picture just behind me is, um, is still on the wall here at Stamford Bridge. I just wonder... Will that be replaced by Enzo Fernandez? Because the talks are very much still ongoing. Chelsea officials remain in Portugal this evening, helping to try and get that deal for the World Cup winner over the line. The deal is still not fully agreed, but as I said, confidence that there is time to do that. Uh, the main issue is the clubs can't agree the structure of the payments. So one source told our chief reporter, Cave Solical, uh, that uh, Benfica want three payments in two years. Chelsea want to pay that over five years. They say if it's over two years, then it should be an overall reduced fee. So that's what those talks have been centering on and why this has taken so long. And so suddenly things have got very musical and suddenly things have got just very deadlined out. I'm scared to look around and see what this is. We don't know what it is. Uh, but that's uh, talks are ongoing. Uh, the deadline is 11 o'clock and uh, this could well fall into deal sheet territory where clubs can um, you know, look for special dispensation to, uh, to, to extend that further. But talk's ongoing. Brilliant stuff. Well done with those distractions there going on. Let's go back because I think we've had a goal. Thanks, Paul. We have had a goal. Sean Longstaff doesn't score many. He got the first of the night for Newcastle. Dorsey's got another. Yeah, it's absolutely magnificent from Newcastle. It's from, from the 21st minute from the start. It's down the left, Joel Linton uh, and Willock combined fantastic just inside their own half the player one two will it get to James Bree the new signing for, for, for Southampton it's been a tough tough start for him Almiron comes from the right wing all the way across and, and will it just reverses the pass inside the the box he then reverses it back to the penalty box and it's, it's Sean Longstaff he just glides from midfield I said early on while the microphone was off <laughs> he's an unsung <laughs> hero for Newcastle I honestly believe that you talk about Gamera as he gets all, uh, all applauded but he is box to box he is and he's, he's got a second goal penalty, bo uh, penalty spot side of the foot Gavi Brazuno's left left hand side is absolutely no chance. It's been one way traffic, three 0 on aggregate, two 0 on the night, and them Georges they they've got their hotel book because they are they've been magnificent and it looks like they're going to Wembley on the 26th of February for the final. Yeah, because Southampton have now got to score three goals against the defence that hasn't conceded at St James's Park since the 8th of October. It is a big, it's a huge, it's a, a mountainous ask for Southampton Newcastle eyeing up a first League Cup final for 47 years. We're going to turn our attention to Chelsea. We're waiting for news on Enzo Fernandez. It's the deal that will trump <coughs> any deal in this window. It'll be a British record transfer fee, assuming it goes through. Um, generally, Chelsea... I'll come to you first this time, um, Chris. I'm enjoying watching this game, Jules. Hey? I'm enjoying watching this game. Well, you're here to talk transfers. Leave that to doors. Tell him again, doors. Se seven new signings so far for Chelsea. Uh, Fernandez would take Chelsea's total spend under the new owners in two windows past £600 million. What have you made of how they've gone about their business this month as well? Well, only time will tell you know, how, it's, how it's going to um, pan out. What I will say is that there was a rebuild needed at Chelsea. It looks as if they've decided to do it in two windows. Fair play at them. If you've got the money to go and do it, then carry on. Um, I think that, you know, if, if you're Graham Potter, you probably wouldn't want as many bodies coming into the building at, at the one time. But, you know, we've seen it with Nottingham Forest in terms of um, the amount of bodies that came in. It takes time to jail. Um, Chelsea are under pressure. They're going to have to start winning games on a regular basis and performing um, to a level that, you know, the Chelsea fans expect. But, you know, it might be that they've just tried to get everything done, as I said, in those two windows, looking, um, you know, to, to next season. 
you know, they've already had, well, you know, the players that are in it will give them three, four months to, you know, of, of uh, blending in together before pre-season starts. Then, you know, you'd expect them maybe adding a one or two in the summer. Um, there's no doubt I still think they need a striker um, or two. But once you get that, the team, you know, should be gelled and they'll be looking forward to not only challenging for a top four spot next year, pushing on and trying to win the title. I mean, I mean, from Mudrick to Barrier Shield to Santos to Madueki to Jal Felix's loan, um, so many have said it's, it looks like a scattergun approach. Is there more, f- f- is there a more formulated plan than that to you? Uh, yeah, I can see both. You know, I think initially where we were just looking at players just coming in, but I think when you look at it on the whole now, of course these owners, they're intelligent people, they'll, they'll have a, you know, a, a remit and you can see that they want the best young talent from around the world. Who, who can we get that can, can build this team? And I think it's difficult to, to sort of say in the short term how effective it's going to be, but I think certainly long term, I think it's something that... that yeah, they, they've got in some some real excellent players, but I think when you look, when all of the players come back fit for Chelsea, they're going to have so many <coughs> bodies in there. So I think that's where they're certainly going to have to offload and and so many attacking options. So yeah, it, it's really interesting to see because, like like Chris said, it is you know it, it's a rebuild, isn't it? it? It's like they've had to rebuild off the field with the new ownership, also on the field, the players coming in. So that is going to take time, and it's going to take time for Graham Potter to to get this team the way he wants them and, and the way they want them to be interesting because it said Lukaku could come back as well I mean I think he's in, he's in loan obviously isn't he? Yeah, but it yeah. said he would come back as well I know it didn't work from the first time but a change of manager you never know because if you can get back up to you know, any level of, of um, goal scoring with the amount of talent they've got you just never know with him either you know, so they have got attacking yeah. um, you know, I've said that you need one or two I still think they do yeah. um, but there's no doubt that, that you know, the, the wide players they it, and they've got players there. Their youth structure has been that great over the years. They've got players there. I mean, you can see, talk of Conor Gallagher going for, what, 30, 40 million pounds. There's other ones there that can go. So they can generate money as well. I mean, they're not daft Chelsea. They know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and as I said, it will take time to, to build it, but they've decided we're going to get as many bodies in as we possibly can in these two windows. And you've both said it's you know, longer term is what they're looking at. But I mean, shorter term, this is Chelsea, Clinton. They're 10 points off the Champions League places. <clears throat> With the money they're spending, will Potter be expected to pull off the mirror? and finish top four. Yeah, but I don't think it's Graham Potter signing all the players. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, signing all the players. No, I don't think he's been given them. And now but he has been given them. To yeah, but it's going to take time to gel, though, um, George. You can't expect all those players for him to just make it gel like that and it work overnight. It's going to take a bit of time. So they'll accept I've, it if they don't finish top no, four? No, I've always said beforehand, and we always have a debate about it, I think he needs to finish in the top four. I think if he doesn't finish in the top four, Graham Potter will come under pressure. But I think there's a long-term project at Chelsea with Todd Bowley, and I think he'll back Graham Potter, and I think he will stay. I think he will stay. He's had this transfer window. I think he'll get another one in the summer. And then, as Boydy said, they have to finish in the top four. All right, next season, they have to be competing. When you spend that kind of money, you have to be competing. But the problem I see is, how are you going to keep all these players happy when they're all fit? Because you're not going to be some as well, though. There'll be some They'll have to lose some, some Boydy. They have yeah. to, because you're, gonna, you're not going to keep everyone yeah. fit. Yeah. You've signed loads of players. Yeah, I know, I know. So you won't be able to keep everyone fit. Yeah. I know Jorginho's gone, and obviously there's talk of Fernandez, but there'll be pressure on Potter, for sure, Jules. And I think you're right. He has to finish in the top four, but they're a long way off at the moment. Still waiting for news on Enzo Fernandez. Time is starting to run out, isn't it? Two and a half hours to go for Chelsea to get that British record deal done. Uh, while we wait, back to Vicky. <laughs> Indeed, because we've got some new pictures into us here at Sky Sports News with that window closing in just two and a half hours' time. These cars have been arriving at Manchester United's training grounds. You see the second one here has Marcel Sabitza in it, apparently. Uh, he did go through rather quickly. You didn't see him, but he is in that car, and they're looking to work out this low move as we speak so that they can get that done and over the line. Of course, this has been forced due to the fact that Christian Eriksen's ankle injury is going to keep him out of Manchester United until late April. So they've moved really quickly in this window, even though earlier on today, Eric Ten Hag told us at a press conference that it looked really difficult to get someone in through this window. But the big news is, is that Marcel Sabitzer is on his way to finalise that deal, that low move in the next couple of hours. The big transfer news this hour, though, for you. Jorginho has signed and another goal's gone in. We'll have more on that in just a minute. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jorginho has signed for Arsenal for £12 million, an 18-month deal. We'll be back to that Carabao Cup semi-final for you next. Stay with us.
Uh, the breaking news at the bottom of your screen is a new signing for Bournemouth. Uh, Ilya Zabani is in at the club. We'll tell you more details about that in just a few minutes' time. But firstly, we've got to get to another goal at St James's Park. And I hope those Newcastle fans who Michael Dawson told to start booking their hotels for Wembley have got a cancellation policy <laughs> because it's not quite certain. There's another goal. Yeah, it's a great goal by, by Southampton. It's, it's a great game of football. 29 minutes in. Newcastle will be so disappointed the way they give the ball away. They're in control of possession. It's down the left-hand side. Dan Byrne lends the ball to Joe Willock in the left-hand side as, as Adam Armstrong goes. And he just goes back to play it to Bruno Gomerius and he passes a ball straight to Che Adams. Che Adams, 25 yards out, takes a touch with his left foot, swivels on the half volley and he just sit this rocket straight across uh, Nick Pope's right hand, right hand and it skips off the surface and goes in the bottom corner. What a strike by Che Adams it was. 2-1, game on, Jules. Yeah, ninth goal of the season for Che Adams. It's 3-1 on aggregate now. First goal that St, uh, Newcastle have conceded at St James's Park since October. And in fact, it's the first time Nick Pope's conceded in 11 games and the best part of 16 hours of football, which is quite incredible, isn't it? Uh, right, let's get you to um, some other clubs and update on what's been happening at <laughs> Fulham, first of all. Breaking news in the last hour was that they have made a deadline day signing. Eleanor Roper can tell us more. Hi, Ali. Hi there. Yes, things are definitely picking up here at Fulham. They've made one signing and they are closing in on a second. As you mentioned there, Sasha Lukic, the Serbian midfielder, has joined Fulham from Torino. We know that the Fulham doctor travelled out to Italy yesterday to carry out his medical. He joins the club on a four-and-a-half-year deal and there's also an option to add on a further 12 months. He says he can't wait to be a, a Fulham player and to play alongside Alexander Mitrovic. Now, a second signing is looking more hopeful now now we know that Marco Silva had said he wanted to make two signings by the close of play today but I think Fulham fans have maybe been giving up hope on Cedric Suarez coming from Arsenal but that is now looking up Fulham hopeful of closing in on that before the end of the night tonight. Now in terms of outgoings two players have left the club today. We've seen Nathaniel Chalabar he's left, he's gone to West Brom and Joshua Onoma. Now he left the club by mutual consent, his contract terminated by mutual agreement and since it's been announced this evening that he's gone to Preston North End. So two players out tonight, one player done and it looks like we could get a second by the close of play this evening. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much, Ellie. Right, let's get to developments on Nottingham Forest because they've been pretty busy in this window. Rob Dorset has got the details on their pursuit of a defender. What have you got for us, Rob? Well, Vicky, it's, it's oh, apt you've got former Nottingham Forest centre-back Michael Dawson in the studio with you this evening because Forest are closing in on the signing of another one. Felipe, the Brazilian, 33 years old, from Atletico Madrid. We told you over 12 hours ago now on Sky Sports News when we broke the news that uh, they'd agreed a fee, Forest, with Atletico uh, for his services. He flew into the country early this morning and I can tell you that he has now just passed and completed his Nottingham Forest medical. So he's got less than two and a half hours to finalise the the contractual agreement with Nottingham Forest, sign on the dotted line and register as a Nottingham Forest player before that 11 o'clock deadline. We can show you the pictures that tell you the story of his day, really, so far at Nottingham Forest. It was uh, at about half past 10, 11 o'clock this morning when he arrived here at Forest Training Ground, uh, chauffeured in one of the Forest cars and walked up the steps by uh, one of the Forest officials to meet Steve Coper, the, the, the Forest manager, uh, and begin negotiations. And then uh, a couple of hours later... At around lunchtime, we saw him leave the forest training ground again. Um, and this was heading to a local hospital to begin that medical. Um, and that medical has taken several hours, uh, as you'd expect. Forrest want to be very thorough with all of the scans and that sort of thing. Look, Felipe wound down his window and gave us a little wave as he went past, which was uh, a nice moment. Um, is he going to be a Nottingham Forest player? Can he get this deal done before that 11 o'clock deadline? Now, a lot of Forest fans asking, and Newcastle fans as well, asking about John Joe Shell because that's a deal we thought would have been done this time yesterday. Why is it dragging on so much? Well, the impression I get is that with Newcastle playing in that, uh, that cup semi-final tonight, that's probably delayed things a little bit. I think both clubs want to get that out of the way before they make any final announcements and that sort of thing. And we've also talked about Kayla Navas, a three-times Champions League winner that we thought was dead and buried as a deal for Forrest earlier on this afternoon. 
because of the huge wages that he's on at Paris Saint-Germain. But it looks like the two clubs have come to a compromise over who will pay those wages with, as I understand it, PSG still picking up the lion's share of those wages. Whilst he's still in Paris, there's confidence here in Nottingham that they can get that deal done before the deadline as well. So three deals that Forest are still trying to get done with only two and a half hours of the window left. It's going to go to the wire for Nottingham Forest. It certainly is. Really busy club there. Thanks ever so much, Rob. Meanwhile, as that was all happening, you can see from the breaking news, Bournemouth have made a signing. Mark McAdam can tell us more about it. Mark, are you there? I am indeed. I'm not going anywhere. Don't you worry about that. But we've had official confirmation of a story we've been talking about over the course of the last 24 hours on Sky Sports News. And it's regarding a very exciting signing for AFC Bournemouth. They confirm in a statement they have completed the signing of highly rated Ukraine international Ilya Zabani from Dynamo Kiev. We understand the deal to be worth around £24 million. So once again, another significant investment from the Bournemouth board as they back Gary O'Neill in this transfer window. He'll become the club's fifth signing in January, but there could still be more to come. We'll talk about that in just a few moments' time. Zabani has been capped 24 times by his country. He's penned a five-and-a-half-year deal as well, so he's going to be down on the south coast for some time. The club's chief executive has been speaking as well, and he said in the statement that uh, despite only being 20, he has played at the highest level for club and country and has established himself as one of the most most sought after young defenders in the world. So that'll be seen as a real coup for AFC Bournemouth. But what we just said then was it was five. What about six? Now, information is reaching me in the last few moments as well that they can almost confirm a six signing and their second on deadline day. Hamad Traore, the Sassuola midfielder who is joining on loan initially but will make it an obligation where they'll purchase him in the summer. We're expecting that deal to, to be confirmed really in the next few minutes as well. So uh, significant moves from AFC Bournemouth as, as they look to strengthen on deadline day. Signing number five confirmed. Signing number six close. Will there be a signing number seven? I'm not going anywhere just yet. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, let's just take a break from transfers for now to bring you the news that police in the UK have apologised to relatives of the victims of the Hillsborough disaster, acknowledging that policing was the primary cause of the tragedy in 1989. It's the first time that national police leaders have said sorry for how the families have been treated. 97 fans died after the crush at the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. A 2016 inquest ruled that the fans were unlawfully killed amid a number of police errors. Police bosses have now promised to admit mistakes and not defend the indefensible as they set out long-awaited reforms, including a pledge from all forces to ensure accountability for public tragedies. Policing is apologising and recognising that policing was the primary cause of the disaster, the Hillsborough disaster, tragedy. But policing is also apologising for the now nearly 34 years that the families have had to wait to have their questions answered, to have justice, uh, to have some form of closure about what happened on that awful day. It's a, a serious report and Plissing wants to thank uh, Bishop Jones for the, the diligence and candour that he brought to his report. Uh, he raised serious issues. There are 25 recommendations for other agencies beyond Plissing. Plissing has less than half. It's important in making our apology that we're sincere. Uh, it's important in making our response that we talk meaningfully about what we're going to do to make sure that we learn from what happened and do our very best to promise and commit that that will never happen again. It's been five more years of waiting for the families of the, uh, the bereaved to hear what they've heard uh, today. This was the response to a report put out in November 2017 by the former Bishop of Liverpool, the, uh, the Right Reverend James Jones, that looked at the experience of those bereaved families and, and tried to ensure that the pain and suffering that they had suffered wouldn't be endured by others in, in future public tragedies. It's taken more than five years. We now have this apology from the police forces of England and Wales. Police forces have also signed up to a charter for the bereaved families of public tragedies. Though the police forces admit mistakes and don't, in the words of this report, defend uh, the indefensible, they say progress is being made. 
They say there is much further to go as, as tragedies like the Manchester Arena bombing show, uh, they say, but they, they believe it will be for the public to judge whether police forces are going far enough, uh, fast enough. I should say the author of that report, the Reverend James Jones, has welcomed it. He said that there, he believes there needs to be a royal commission rather than a piecemeal approach to, to making these changes. He also points out, as the families of the victims have pointed out, that even now, more than five years on, the government, which said it would respond in due course back in 2017, still hasn't responded. It's almost impossible to move on. It's, you know, we know that if they do come out with some sort of a statement from the government, and, you know, even if it's a formal apology from them, again, it's too late. It's taken too long. And, of course, how long are we going to wait? We've waited five years for this or 34 years from the disaster itself, and we're still waiting. And the government, I, I really don't know if they're ever going to say anything. Uh, it is approaching half-time in the Carabao Cup semi-final second leg. Newcastle 2, Southampton 1 with a minute and a half to go. 3-1 Newcastle lead on aggregate. That's live on Sky Sports Football and main event. Coming up here on Deadline Day next, we'll round up all the transfers from the EFL.
Uh, more on Jao Cancelo coming up. EFL transfer news as well, but there's a the small matter of a Carabao Cup semi-final second leg being played this evening. Newcastle 2, Southampton 1. Nearly half-time, Michael Dawson. It was a, uh, a really busy first half an hour with those three goals. What's been happening since it's then? Been, it's been a really good half of football. We're, we're into three minutes of tied up, time <coughs> added on. Kieran Trippi is going to be whipping another ball in. We've seen his delivery all season, and Newcastle have had opportunities. Um, Southampton have, have just made a substitution. Uh, Kyle Walker Peters had to go off injury, and Samuel uh, Adozi's come on. So it's changed the formation a little bit. They set up with a back, back five. Um, it'll probably suit them actually because they, they are they're having to defend well. But on the counter attack, Che Adams and uh, Armstrong have been very, very active up top as he's in. Yeah, it comes to nothing. It's going to be half time 2 1, but it's been a good game of football. Southampton will be getting in half time. They've conceded chances. But to be only 2-1 down, they will be delighted. Nathan Jones was saying, look, we get the next goal, it's, it's, it's game on. Anthony Gordon's in the crowd as the half-time whistle goes. And John Joe Shelby's there as well. He's been in Nottingham signing for Forrest, which has not yet been confirmed. But he's there in the crowd at, at St James's tonight. He's had a busy day up and down the motorway, hasn't he? Yeah, obviously a, a club that's, that, that's close to him. Newcastle, he signed in 2016, played an awful lot of games. <coughs> not played a, a lot this season through probably opportunities as well as injuries. And, and, and now your time comes where you, you want to go and, and prolong your career, you want to go and play football, and, and he's had the chance to sign for Nottingham Forest. It looks like that's going to happen. I saw a picture of him at the, uh, at the training ground today at Nottingham, and he's, he's gone back to St James. He's great. <laughs> for good signing for Forest? Um, yeah, good signing. If you can get him fit, obviously he's been out. Um, for a while, but I think the way they play, he gets on the ball, he's, he's, what he is, he's very po positive. John Joe Shelby, whenever you get him, he takes free kicks, he whips it in, he's a confident kind of player and he wants to take it. The way Forrest play with the three in the middle of the park, it'll be good. Uh, Danilo coming in yeah. and um, Scarpa, he might then go in, you've got Ryan Yates who, who's not played in recently. So He's got options, Steve Cooper, and I think it was, it was a no-brainer, someone who's got Premier League experience and he knows I don't think he's quite fit at this moment in time, but when he does get an opportunity, I think it's uh, a, a good signing. Yeah, great passing range on him, John Joe Shelby. I'm just going to play a little ten-yard through ball to Thicky. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nod it on. Um, <laughs> not very well. All right, don't laugh at me. Uh, right, uh, let's turn our attention to because, of course, it's not just uh, transfers in the Premier League that are happening today. It's also transfers in the EFL, and David Craig has the latest for us on that matter. David, what have you got? Yes, Vicky, welcome back again to Preston. We're in the EFL headquarters. Lots of work going on here tonight, late into that deadline of 11 o'clock to try and get deals across the line. An interesting one just up the road um, from Preston at Bolton. Luke Mbete, a highly thought of England under-21 international with Manchester City. He is joining Bolton on loan, we are hearing. And also Amari Hutchinson, a product of Chelsea's very successful youth academy. We hear he's in the process of completing a loan deal up to West Bromwich Albion. Stoke City in the market for defenders. They're chasing Charlie Cresswell, we're hearing, from Leeds United tonight. And also an interesting one as well. Um, Emmanuel um, Longolo, sorry, could make his move from Birmingham, sorry, from West Ham to Birmingham permanent. He's at Birmingham on loan at the moment. A fee in the region of 400,000, we understand, will make his services permanent at St Andrews. And at Derby County, Paul Warren doing such a great job there down at Derby County. Harvey White is joining from Tottenham Hotspur on loan. And just one transfer, I think, Vicky, we should mention tonight. A real lovely human interest story. Kevin MacDonald, who was last seen playing for Dundee United in 2021 season, he had a kidney problem. His brother Fraser donated him one of his own kidneys so he could carry on playing football. And he's back after a long break and has joined Exeter City. So we wish him all the very best. That's the real true spirit of brotherly love on transfer deadline day for sharing that one with us. That's great, David. Thank you uh, so much for that update on all things EFL. Uh, now, Jao Cancelo, this raised a few eyebrows earlier when he joined Bayern Munich. It's a loan deal for the uh, rest of the season. It's an initial loan, but Bayern then have the option to buy him for more than £61 million in the summer. I know that Bayern is a team that lives titles, a club that every year wins. And I came here with the intent to continue to maintain essa, essa motivação uh, e essa fome por, por títulos. É um clube grandioso, um dos melhores clubes do mundo. Um, e claro que estou, estou muito contente por estar aqui, uh, poder jogar com, com grandes jogadores 
que, que temos no nosso plantel e espero que consigamos ganhar muitos títulos juntos. Well, Cancelo has also denied falling out with Pep Guardiola. He said this. It's like this, exactly for this that I looked for a change because of the limited minutes that I had in the last few weeks. It has nothing to do with my relationship with the manager, with Pep. It has to do with what I wanted. More minutes, to have a big club behind me like Bayern and to leave for a new adventure. I'm very happy to be here. Like I said, it's a huge club with a lot of history. I'm very, very happy to represent this club. Apparently there has been a fallout, it has to have been a, a, a substantial fallout to um, make a decision that quickly and then Bayern Munich's been after a fullback for a long time. Pavard made it clear in the, in the first six months of the season that he wants to leave the club. He's out of contract at the end of the, at the, end of the season uh, and it also gives Bayern Munich the option to uh, play maybe at left back and move Alfonso Davies a bit further forward because going forward they're really struggling at the moment. So um, uh, a very good move for Cancelo and I think a brilliant signing for Bayern Munich. Cancelo leaves Manchester. Marcel Sabitzer heads the other way to Manchester United from Bayern. This is him arriving a short time ago at the Carrington training ground. Uh, all set to join on loan initially for Manchester United following that injury to Christian Eriksen. They're up against the clock though, just over two hours to go for Manchester United to get that done. Arsenal, their business is done in terms of Jorginho anyway. This was him a short time ago arriving at uh, the club. Jorginho signing for Arsenal from Chelsea on deadline day.
Chelsea locked in negotiations over a British record fee for Benfica midfielder Enzo Fernandez, but time is running out with just two hours to go until the transfer window closes. Marcel Sabitza has arrived at the Manchester United training ground. The midfielder is set to complete a loan move from Bayern Munich. Welcome along to deadline day. Manchester United and Chelsea both looking to seal late deals. But as you can see behind our guests here, time is against them. Less now than two hours to go. Yeah, as well as Fernandez and Sabitza, there are a number of big deals. We're still waiting on these two guys. Carvin Darmesh, if you don't already know them, busy <laughs> beavering away. Uh, Pedro Porra to Tottenham. Matt Doherty to Atletico, you're saying nothing. Hakim Ziyech to PSG. Kayla Navas to Nottingham Forest. Cedric Suarez to Fulham. We'll have the latest from these two very shortly. Thanks. As for done deals, uh, Arsenal have signed Jorginho from Chelsea. That's a deal worth £12 million. Pounds. That boosts their midfield, ahead of their push for the Premier League title. While it is a case of departures at their nearest rivals, Manchester City, as Jao Cancelo heads to Bayern Munich on loan. It's the transfer team. You're almost there. You're winding down. And you wore a three-piece suit today. Well done. That looks really nice. Yeah. And you've got your top button open because you're absolutely exhausted. It's like that. But anyway, a little bit more from you two, please. I'm going to start with you, Carve. Uh, where are we on the Enzo Fernandez? Look, uh, Chelsea have been locked in talks with Benfica trying to get this deal done. Mm -hmm. Everybody now knows he's got a €120 million Euro release clause, £105 million. Pounds. Chelsea have said we're willing to pay it but we can't pay it in one go mm. uh, because of financial fair play, because of the tax implications. We want to pay it over five years, six instalments, five years. Benfica have gone, you've got to be joking. You would, right? Yeah, you've got to be joking. This, this yeah. is a release clause. Mm -hmm. You can't pay a release clause in six instalments over five years. That's yeah. not a release clause. But Benfica have said, look, counter-proposal, you can pay it in three instalments over two years. We're really going out of our way okay. to accommodate you. Even though it's a release clause, we'll let you pay it three instalments over two years. Chelsea have gone, well, so we're not sh still not sure. And what I've been told by one source is that Chelsea have gone in with a lower initial offer than the release clause. Uh, OK, so it takes them up. But they say yeah. with the add-ons yeah. and the bonuses, mm -hmm. potentially it would get to the release clause. Crafty. And that is the last proposal that they put to Benfica. Uh, Benfica are thinking about whether to accept that or not. We're also being told that the player uh, has had his medical in Lisbon uh, with representatives from Chelsea present. Okay. So the deal still could happen as long as they sort out this issue of the structure of how the release clause is paid. The player himself, he wants to move. Uh, he didn't train today. He's not playing for them this evening in their game. Yeah. Uh, but He's been pretty well behaved. You know, he hasn't gone on strike. He hasn't uh, kicked up a fuss. There was mm. a little incident where he went to Argentina for a New Year's Eve party without permission. But apart from that, <laughs> he's been a very... He's young, though, isn't he? I mean, he's a young, talented player. That he's, it's, His rise has been meteoric. Yes. And one final point I would make, uh, because I know Darmesh needs to get in. One final point I would get is... Um, <laughs> Hurry on. Look... On. A lot of Chelsea fans are hoping this deal gets done. Yeah. A lot of River Plate fans are hoping oh. this deal will get done as well. Knock on. Because yeah. River Plate sold Enzo Fernandez to Benfica for mm -hmm. £10 million pounds last summer. They've got a 25% release clause. Wow. So if this goes through, they could make something like £25, £30 million pounds from it. One hour, 55 minutes. Do you think it'll happen? <clears throat> I keep saying it's touch and go. I don't know whether it's touch or go or <laughs> touch means go he touch. goes or he stays, <laughs> but I still think it's in the balance if okay. they can just sort out this issue uh, of the structure. All right, so we've seen Marcel Sabitza go through the gate at Carrington. The lever arch went up. He went through. Um, what's happening here then? Well, it was recently, it's about four days ago, Manchester United weren't going to go into the market on deadline day. They were done. Incomings, outgoings, there might have been a couple of outgoings on loan here and there. Christian Eriksen then gets injured. Eric Ten Hag breaks the news today. That's bad news for Manchester United and their fans that Eriksen is out until late April, maybe even early May. Yeah. So now they're thinking, we need to go into the market. And an opportunity presented itself with Marcel Sabitza. Now, this is a, the deal itself has come last minute. But the actual player 
they've been looking at for a little while. Because in the summer, when they were going for Frankie de Jong, when they were going for Casemiro, they ended up getting Casemiro, of course. One of the names being mooted was Marcel Sabitzer. Okay. Now, the deal itself is a straight loan, which I think works for everyone. Manchester United will get competition for places and a replacement for Ericsson for the rest of the season. Whereas Bayern Munich know that he's got two and a half years left on his contract. If he performs well for the next six months, he comes back to Bayern Munich and his market value will still be at a good level. OK. So that's where we're at at the moment. Um, he's in Manchester now. Yep. He's at the training ground. We think they would have got a lot of the data with regard to his medical from Bayern Munich already. Such was the rush to get the deal done. There will be a few medical checks going on now, but it will just be dotting the I's and crossing the T's on that contract for the loan. And we expect United to be covering the full wages for a Marcel Sabitzer for the rest of the season. OK, you're looking twitchy. Have you got something to say? Or you're no, just no, no, twitchy? no, no, no. It's fine. Just... fine. No, because I, I'm going to stay with yeah. you because you've just... got some Fulham news. That's right. So, okay. Cedric Suarez. It was on at the start of the window. It was yeah. off. It was on. It was off. It looks like it's on now. Okay. So, Arsenal, right back to yeah. Fulham, on loan, a straight loan, no option. Now, Fulham have a bit of a difficulty here because Premier League rules state you can only have two, two loans yeah, from, from English club. clubs. Yeah. They have Shane Duffy from Brighton. They have Daniel James from Leeds United. So they can't get Cedric Suarez unless Suarez joins on a permanent or one of either Shane Duffy or Dan James leaves or what they're going to do is what we've been reporting in the last week. Shane Duffy's loan move will then become a permanent deal. Right. So that frees up that other, other loan. One. We think now that Cedric Suarez, that deal is agreed in principle. Okay. He's been having a medical. That's a case, hopefully, in the five, what less than two hours now, that one will get over the line. OK, brilliant stuff. As all this was happening, we've had some breaking news. Let's go back to Jules. Yeah, thanks, Vicky. Breaking news. You'll have spotted it at the bottom of your screen. It's a signing for Crystal Palace. It's a midfielder. It's not Conor Gallagher, who has been linked with a return. Uh, it is a permanent deal for the 20-year-old French under-18 international midfielder, uh, Nairou Almada. Three-and-a-half-year deal for him. He joins from uh, Stuttgart. The fee that's been banded about is around £10.5 million. Pounds. Palace haven't confirmed that, but that's the sort of ballpark you're looking at. Uh, only made his senior debut for Stuttgart two years ago after a spell at the Juventus Academy. Uh, he's a box Box to box midfielder, and he has signed for Crystal Palace. They've been very quiet this month, but on deadline day, they have brought in a new midfielder on a three and a half year deal. That is Nauru Ahmada. Right, let's get to Arsenal, who uh, got a deal over the line in the last hour or so, didn't they? And as you've heard, there's an outgoing potentially as well. Let's cross live to Gail Davis. She can bring us the full story on Jorginho. Hi, Gail. Yeah, very good evening to you, Jules. It was confirmed, wasn't it, about an hour ago, Jorginho swaps West London for North London in a deal worth £12 million. An 18-month contract him with the option of an extra year. Remember, just six months left on his Chelsea contract. Now, we got a few pictures, didn't we, linked with him and his agent in, in an Arsenal shirt and socks a little bit earlier on. But we've now seen he'll wear the number 20 shirt and we've seen a couple of pictures of him at the Arsenal training ground with Arteta. He talked, actually, in his interview for the website about how Arteta was a huge influence for him. He said, I know he tried to get me before. Um, and he says, I'm very excited for this new challenge. It happened so fast. I was a bit surprised, as I think a number of people were over the last few days. We knew Arteta wanted a midfielder. We didn't necessarily think it was Jorginho who was going to arrive. But this is what Arteta did say. He said, Jorginho is a midfield player with intelligence, deep leadership skills and a huge amount of Premier League and international experience. He's won in his career, but he still has the hunger and huge willingness to contribute here. We're so pleased to sign Jorginho and welcome him and his family to the club. Remember, they wanted to bolster that midfield. They have got uh, Thomas Partey <coughs> and Granit Xhaka, who've both been hugely impressive this season, but they are thin on the ground. And news emerged early this morning that Mohamed El Neni has got a serious injury to his right knee. He had an operation, so they were uh, desperate to make sure they have enough players in their squad as they not only try and fight for this Premier League title, but Europe as well. It will be Thursday, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday for 
Arteta's squad, won't it, in the next few months. And this is what Chelsea had to say. Jorginho leaves Stamford Bridge after four and a half years and they posted this, a leader on and off the pitch. Uh, from the moment he arrived in West London from Napoli, Jorginho was coolness personified from the penalty spot with his trademark hop-skip technique. Perhaps his most iconic conversation was the injury time winner at home to Leeds last season, his second of the game, sparking pandemonium at the bridge. Funny, funny guy, Jorginho leaves Chelsea with 213 appearances to his name, four winners' medals, none more precious than that Champions League success in which he played a major part. Good luck in the future. And of course, he won the Euros with Italy as well. So Arteta has a real leader in his group as this group of players hope to push on and win Arsenal's first Premier League title in almost 20 years. Gail, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Gail Davis live at the Emirates there. Let's get back to uh, the matter of the semi-final in the league. 2-1 to Newcastle at half-time against Southampton. 3-1 on aggregate. Wembley beckons for Newcastle. Five minutes gone in the second half, Michael Dawson. There's been a sending off, but not on the pitch. No, it was at half-time. It was a Southampton first-team coach, Alan Sheehan. I heard something here saying it was for foul and abusive language to Paul Tierney. So he's, he's got a red card. However, Southampton have made two substitutions. Uh, Formation, I said it just before half-time because of the four substitution to Kyle Walker-Peters had gone to a, to a back four. Now Perro's come on at uh, left back. Lavia's come on and sat in front of the back four. Lyanko off and Alvarez off. He started with five minutes into the second half. He started pretty cagey. He didn't start like that in the first half. It was end-to-end, -to -end, but Newcastle now are just a, a little bit more cautious than they were uh, in the first half. Uh, Newcastle headed for Wembley as it stands. Thanks very much indeed. Michael Sky Sports Football, if you'd like to watch that live. Let's get back to transfer matters. Let's get to Tottenham. It's all about right backs tonight. A couple on their way out. And hopefully for the Spurs fans, one in. Michael Bridge is the man who is right across all things Tottenham this evening. Pedro Porro, Michael Bridge. What is happening? Yeah, Jules, I know there's a little bit of concern from a few Spurs fans. Why has it not been announced yet? But I'm told no issues, no problems and that should be announced in the next hour or so. He's very, very excited to come here, of course. The goalposts were moved Sunday night, Monday morning. It looked like it was off, but Spurs moved those goalposts back, and he will be coming on an initial loan fee with the obligation to sign him from July the 1st. So he'll be, he, he had his medical earlier today. Now, one going out is Jed Spence. Now, he's joined Wren. He had a number of options, Jules. Um, a few Premier League clubs, clubs abroad. But he's gone with Wren and a few eyebrows were raised. But Jed Spence, he took his time. He thought about it. Where's the best club for me? And it was simple. He spoke to clubs. I want to play. I want to be in 11. I need to play. And he's got a real target to come back. He wants to play for Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. And I know a lot of supporters think he should have had some opportunities here. He's really unlucky. But he's going to go away now and have six months in France. We'll see how he gets on. And I think now I can give you an interview from Jed Spence speaking about his move. Um, yes, yeah, a good feeling to sign for a club. Um, it's a good club, it's a big club. And I just can't wait to get started. Yeah, it's a good feeling. I've never played in a French league, so I never know, but I guess it, it may be different. I've got to find out for myself, you know. Obviously, it's a big club, and I think opportunity to play in the League 1, League 1. And, um, yeah, I think it's just a big opportunity for myself to test myself um, to see what I can do in this league. You're in the club that will be playing the, the Europa League. Uh, yeah. Maybe a step up for you, is something you are looking forward to? Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Every, every competition is important, so, um, yeah, i just got to be ready. And yeah, it was an early start here at the Tottenham Hotspur training ground in Enfield. But I tell you what, what woke me up this morning, one of the deadline day deals are like Matt Doherty to Atletico Madrid on loan. Wow, that's a fantastic loan move for him. He's going to find chances extremely limited with Pedro Porro's arrival. So Emerson Royale stays, uh, Doherty on his way. So he'll join up with uh, Tottenham left-back Sergei Reguilón, who's there at Atletico Madrid at the moment. You see how well Kieran Trippier did for Atletico Madrid under Diego Simeone. So we see how he gets on here. So I'm here to the bitter end until we hear about Pedro Porro. I'm also told, a bit of Crystal Palace news, Laconga and uh, Ahamada is done. 
my understanding, and I'm told potentially one more coming in at Crystal Palace. So looks like I'm going to be here to the bitter end. Luckily, I've charged my hot water bottle. Well, that's, that's... <laughs> yeah, I was, ju I was just going to come back to you about that, Michael. That's you... not funny. Why? Hot water bottle. Yeah. Bridgie, you're better than that, Bridgie. Hot water bottle. <laughs> that's not even hot anymore. You warmed that up at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and we cut him off. We have the power to do that. Michael Bridge, complete with his hot water bottle, bless him. Oh, uh, what covering a guy. Tottenham for us what uh, and guy. Crystal Palace as well tonight. It's always too warm in the studio. Clinton's only just stopped sweating that it was so hot, didn't you? Yeah, I'm always hot though. Yeah. That's what everyone says. Hot guy. <laughs> hot stuff. Let, let, let's come to the hot guy about Tottenham first of all then. Um, Pedro Porro, you know, yeah. the Spurs fans are getting a bit anxious that they're, they're <clears> desperate <throat> to get him in. Um, they've got the worst defence uh, Tottenham in yeah. the, the top 12 of the Premier League. How big a problem do you think right back, right wing back, if you like, area has been for Spurs? Yeah, it has been a problem. I wouldn't say that's only the problem. I'd say maybe they would have probably wanted a centre half as well. But yeah, I think right wing back, Poro, I think it's a good signing. I was disappointed Spence never got an opportunity. I'm glad he's gone on loan. I would have preferred him to come to Crystal Palace, if I'm being honest. Jed Spence, I think it would have been a good signing, but he's gone to Rennes. You, you wish him well. Matt Doherty, wow. When I saw that Atletico Madrid, it's a great move for Matt Doherty. I think he'll learn under a top manager in Simone. He could come back to um, Tottenham next season, a hell of a player after learning from him. But I think Poro's a really good signing, Jules. And if they can get that over the line, it's been going on for a bit of time now. I think it'd be a brilliant signing. Then I have him and Emerson Rowe competing for that um, number one spot. But I think it'd be a brilliant signing. I've seen a lot of him. Chris, I mean, Podro in, but is, is there any <coughs> element of this? It's a bit of a risk letting both Doherty and Jed Spence leave? Mm. Not really, because I've not really been playing, haven't they? Do you know what I mean? So I think they're obviously they see it as an opportunity to get them out the door. Um, you know, and I think as Clinton says there, if you if you bring in um, a new boy as well, then you know there's, there's already you know, he's going to come in and play. Yeah, um, there's already competition there. Tottenham have got a bloated squad. You know, I think it's safe to say that. Um, and areas that they don't really need. You know, I, mean, I think you know you, you touch on the defensive side of it there. You know, for the for the goals that you know Tottenham should score going forward defensively. I mean, you can't expect them to go and score two and three go uh, goals every single game, so they have to tighten up there. Um, you see, you've got a centre back, you've got one right here, you can get the boots back on. Although he's trying to kid on. Well, well. Same with Tottenham, you can get the boots back on. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what it is. No. But no, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's one thing that you know, Tottenham do need to tighten up at the back because yeah. they can't keep depending on. Um, I mean, they can do it, you know, that front three, whatever it may be, but they need to tighten up at the back, that's for sure. I think that's why it's such a surprise, isn't it? Because Conte side <laughs> yeah, normally yeah. would say that defensively they are so solid. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, Porro would be a, a superb sign. I think the way that he plays now, he plays that system, so I think he just fits straight in. I think the way that Conte plays, they are so, like, that's the, the wing backs ha are so so important. Yeah. So I think he'll just come straight in. He's aggressive. He's quick. He can go inside. He can go outside. So yeah, I think Spurs fans are just crossing their fingers. Yeah. That think, you know, when you look at the fullback yeah. areas, because they are such a you know pivotal point of, yeah, you know, yeah, of, yeah. of Antonio Conte, they have been a weakness for Tottenham. There's no doubt yeah, about it. This definitely, season. I agree. Yeah. Um, uh, Sue, so I want to get a quick reaction from you off the bit of news I'm about to bring you now. Another player who will not be coming to Everton on this deadline day that they're stacking up. Uh, <coughs> Anthony Alanga has been linked with a possible move, a loan move from Manchester United, but the news we're receiving is that he will not be leaving Old Trafford in this window, will not be going to Goodison Park. question is, will anybody be going to Goodison say, Park? That's too? the thing, who will? And I, th I think that's, that's a real worry, isn't it, for, for Evertonians, that sure. you, obviously the, the new managers come in, but yet to make a signing, when all of the teams in and around Everton are, are making signings and yet... Everton are still waiting and, and they keep getting linked with these players and, and they're going off to their, their sort of fellow rivals. So it's a, yeah, it's a real... You know worry. what? I like Sue. I like Jules a lot. Please, Everton, <laughs> hierarchy, if you're listening, just sign two or three players. I want these two to be happy. Thank I you. want Sue to be happy. I want Everton to stay in the Premier League because me and Dor said it last <laughs> week. So yeah, please make some signings. We're running out of time. Oh, Come so on. Yeah. The real reason for the warm wishes are coming out now is because you said they... Yeah, right. said uh, well, yeah. I'm never wrong. It's not about me yeah. and Sue. It is about you and Sue. I like Sue more than I like you, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Only joking, Jules. <laughs> ah. uh, well, listen, there is still time for Everton and the rest of the clubs to do business, but that time is running out. Under two hours now until the deadline. Plenty more more deals we are still waiting on those stay with us right here on sky sports news for the very latest through the evening
Uh, one hour, 37 minutes left of this transfer window. Enzo Fernandez to Chelsea, not yet done. Pedro Porro to Spurs, not yet done. Marcel Sabitzer to Manchester United, not yet done. Jorginho from Chelsea to Arsenal, done. Let's hear from him now. And what does it mean to you to play in this famous red and white shirt? It's, it's an important shirt. It's an, an amazing club, a big one. And uh, I'm really, really excited and happy to be here. Short but sweet, that is the new Arsenal man, uh, Jorginho. Less than half an hour to go at St James's Park for Newcastle to see this out and book their place at Wembley in the Carabao Cup final. And they've started to make some changes, Michael. Yeah, we're in the 62nd minute, Jules. And Southampton have been the better team. They've had all the possession in the second half, but they yet to cause Nick Paul any problems. And, and Newcastle and Eddie Howe has, has made a triple substitution. So Wilson off, Almer off and Joe Willock off sent Maximum, Jacob Murphy and Isak on. We saw it last week when Isak came on he, he changed and, and made the goal for Joe Linton. But second half Southampton have been far the better team and, and still in with, with a chance in this game. They're just... They're having all the possession. Lavia in the middle of the, the, the field for, for Southampton. He gets on the ball, he tries to play it forward and he, he's been very good since he's changed it. But Nick Pope is yet to be tested. Still 2-1 Newcastle. Looks like Newcastle are heading to Wembley. We're heading over to Vicky. You are indeed, because I'm with Carve and Darmesh. And Carve, you've got some news... Yeah, just a little bit of an update on the Enzo Fernandez situation with, what, about 90 minutes to go. There may be a little bit of movement that could be good news for Chelsea. OK. I I'm not 100% sure yet, but there may have been something that could see the deal happen uh, surrounding the issue of the structure of the payments. Uh, staying at Chelsea as well, Hakim Ziyech. Uh, guy who had a brilliant World Cup. Lots of interest in him from clubs in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. But he wants to go to PSG. Okay. That deal is getting close. I think it's going to be a loan. Dream move for him to go to PSG, play with Messi, Neymar, Mbappe. He really wants to make this happen. Uh, another Moroccan player at the World Cup, Sofian Amrabat, one of the best midfielders uh, at the World Cup. Barcelona have been trying to get him from Fiorentina being a little bit cheeky, trying to get him cheap on a loan deal. Mm. Uh, and basically Fiorentina have said that is not happening. He is not leaving. He's certainly not going on the cheap to Barcelona. OK. Damash, you were going to just bring in the deal sheet, weren't you? Yeah, Very so briefly. this is quite important now because uh, Jules at the top of the, the part there just said, you know, Sabitz are not done. Pedro Porro, not announced. Enzo Fernandez not announced. Now, it's come to that time between 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock on deadline day, if a club puts in the relevant paperwork that the deal is agreed and everyone has signed it, mm -hmm. but the deal hasn't been f properly finalised, then they get another two hours after 11 o'clock to completely finalise that deal. OK. But if it's an international transfer, which these three would be, they still have to comply with the FIFA transfer matching system, which means that's a midnight deadline. So okay. between 9 o'clock and 11, that is the only window they've got to put this deal sheet in, to give them that extra time to be able to completely finalise that deal. So deal sheets have got to be in then? Before yeah, between 9 and 11, so that time has started yes. now. Who knows, a deal sheet might have gone in already. All right, OK. Let's turn our attentions to Southampton because Mark McAdam is waiting in the wings to tell us a little bit more about a deal there, I believe. Yes, thanks very much, Vicky. It's been a busy day down on the south coast. As you can see, I'm situated at the Vitality Stadium, but keeping my eyes and ears across things happening at St Mary's, of course, most of their fan base will be glued to Sky Sports' main event, seeing if they can get to the League Cup final. But they have been busy today in terms of transfers as well. Let's just bring you up today over what's been happening uh, over the last couple of hours. Kamaldine Suleimana, a player that they have confirmed uh, is uh, going to be joining the football club from Wren. We believe this deal to be around 20 £22 million, pounds plus some add-ons. He's a 20-year-old winger. Um, we've heard Nathan Jones say on numerous occasions over the course of the last few weeks he wants to add potency to his attack, and certainly Suleimana will do that. So that is a big plus for Nathan Jones. Uh, the Ghanaian international had two World Cup appearances in Qatar. We understand that the medical has been completed, the personal terms have been sorted. It's just a case of the club confirming that deal. And the second Southampton 
Southampton deal that has been going on in the background today whilst they prepare for that match at Newcastle is Paul Onuachu, a player that is coming over from Genk, someone that Rasmus Ankerson knows well from his time at Michelin. Rasmus, of course, the Southampton owner. That deal is worth £18 million pounds plus some add-ons there. They were looking for uh, an impact. They were looking for a striker in this window. And they've certainly got a big striker as well. He's six foot seven. So he'll bring a real presence to that Southampton attack. So two players in for Southampton on deadline day, taking their spending to around £45 million. Pounds. OK, so that's good news for Southampton. What about Bournemouth? Because that's actually where you are at the moment. What have you got on them? <laughs> Yes, it, it, multitasking at, at my very best today, which is something you're very good at doing, Vicky. It's not something I'm particularly handy at. But, yeah, another busy day for Gary O'Neill, AFC Bournemouth, Neil Blake, Richard Hughes. They've been working tirelessly over the course of uh, this last 24 hours or so. And they have confirmed two players that have joined on deadline day but are still working in the background as well. The first that was confirmed was Ilya Zabani, which we mentioned about an hour ago on Sky Sports News, a young 20-year-old centre-back. He'll be joining from Dynamo Kiev for £24 million. He's been described to me as probably one of the most promising centre-backs outside of the, the top four divisions in European football. So that's a, a real coup for the football club. He signed a five-and-a-half-year deal as well. We've seen him down on the south coast. He's currently tucked up in his hotel after doing the media duty. So that was the first signing that got confirmed today. And over the last few moments, we've just had confirmation as well, not from the club just yet, but the medical is completed with regards to Hamad Traore, the young young Sassuolo midfielder. It's a £21 million deal. So once again, it takes Bournemouth spending to an excess of £75 million in this window. So Gary O'Neill getting two new faces into the club today. I keep saying it, and I'm going to stand by it, Vicky. Bournemouth haven't shut up shop yet. I know some media organisations have said that they're finished for the day, there'll be no new signings, but they are still working in the offices behind me. So if they can get one final seventh player through the door, that's what they're hoping today. But between Southampton and Bournemouth, the two clubs have spent nearly £100 million today on four new faces. Thank you very much. We're keeping you busy, Mark McAdam. I'm delighted to say that Andy Brassel is still here and you know plenty more on this six foot seven inch striker on Uachu. What can you tell us about he's, him? He's had a really, really prolific couple of seasons, Vicky, in, in, in Belgium. Obviously, it's a, a leap uh, from uh, the Belgian league, uh, the Belgian top division to, to the Premier League. But Southampton have needed that focal point. Mm. Uh, I, I think we've seen Shay Adams does so much good stuff in terms of industry, in terms of holding the ball up. Uh, Onoachi is just a goal scorer. He doesn't always look uh, the most graceful, um, but he's very, very difficult for centre backs to handle, and he's just a great finisher. You know, he doesn't need a lot of chances to to score his goals. So that's great news for Southampton. You compare that to um, you, you look at the link up with that and um, Sulemana, and they clearly want to put a lot into the front half of the team. And you know, that's mm. that's where they've lacked. I, I don't think they've played terribly this season by any stretch of the imagination, Southampton, but they have lacked that at the sharp end and hopefully Onoachu and Suleimana can do that for them. What's really interesting is the fact that the players are, are really keen, as, as Mark was saying, you know, certainly in terms of mm. Bournemouth, you know, there, there's five, six, seven coming through the door. These players are coming in through the doors of Southampton and Bournemouth, certainly Southampton, you know, they're, they're battling against the, the elements at the moment, though, aren't they? Yeah, they, they, they are. And I think Southampton have been working with diminishing returns for, for a few years now. You know, they've lacked really that depth of talent. And I mm. think Ralph Hasenhutl had been pushing a boulder up a hill for a, a pretty long time. I, I think he must look at this window and think, why couldn't that have been me, really, at least, at least belatedly? Mm. But look, I, th I think you look at those sort of players. Suleimana, who started really well at Wren and then got a little bit stuck and... He struggled to get into the team this season with a lot of very talented players in front of him. Onuachu, who's bided his time, very, very consistent goal scorer at a very high level and taking his team to the top of the league this season and mm. looking great doing it. I think you look at Southampton and you can see the other players who've gone there from that mid-level succeeded there and got really big moves. I think you look, at, you look at Mane, you look at Lovren, you look at players like that and you think, OK, that could be me next. Yeah, that's the thing. They've attracted, and they're, they're a good selling club as well. You know, traditionally, Definitely. they brought 
players through the academy, haven't they, and mm. worked on them. But they're bringing in some really interesting talent at the moment. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. And, and look, I think you can see the financial power that's out there for these Premier League clubs in, in, in this January. And it doesn't really feel to me like Southampton are mortgaging their future by any stretch no. of the imagination. You know, they're, they're paying proper money for these guys, but, you know, we're, we're not looking towards, like, sort of ten figures or anything like that. You know, I think, I think they're being sensible. They're targeting guys who they can grow with, who Nathan Jones can really coach and work mm. with and show how good he is as a, as, as, as a coach. But they've needed this injection of, of, of talent for a while so for, to give Southampton fans something to shout. About. Just a word on Nathan Jones. You know, it, it, when you're a new manager, though, you, you almost want to just keep with what you've got and kind of work with what you've got. Will this pose any problems with him for him? The fact that lots of players are coming in. No, I don't think so, Vicky. Because okay. I, I think you have a look at that squad and you think I just need that little bit more quality. Yeah. If it's young, enthusiastic quality, like Onuachu, who wants to prove himself at the very top level, Suleimana, who has been kicking his heels behind some very good players at Wren. And they've both got something to prove for very, very different reasons. And Southampton are going to give them the opportunity to do it. Yeah, good news for Southampton fans then. OK, stay with us, Andy. We'll have plenty more from him later. Fulham have signed a player from their London rivals. We'll have all the deals for you next on deadline day with that clock ticking down. OK, let's uh, head out and about and update you on a couple of clubs and what they're doing with just over an hour and 23 minutes left of transfer deadline day. Uh, Fulham have agreed a deal now to sign Cedric Suarez from Arsenal. Eleanor Roper can bring us more details. Eleanor. 
Yeah, it's almost done, Jules. We understand that he's having a medical as we speak. I think this morning Fulham fans might have given up on that move from Arsenal. It had gone a bit quiet, but Fulham hopeful. As you say, they've agreed it in principle and they're hopeful of completing that by the end of the night tonight. A medical happening as we speak. One thing to bring you, though, is that will have a knock-on effect on Shane Duffy because under Premier League rules, a club can only have two players on loan from any English side. So Shane Duffy, who's on loan uh, to Fulham from Brighton, that will be converted to a permanent deal and that's because Suarez will be coming to Fulham on loan. Now that would be their second signing of the window and that's because earlier on today they already had agreed the uh, the Serbian midfielder Sasha Lukic that was on a four and a half year deal. He's travelled to the UK today. We understand that the, the Fulham doctor actually travelled out to Italy yesterday to Turin to carry out his medical. He's coming here um, arriving in the UK today. The 26 year old says he can't wait to, to join Fulham and to play alongside Alexander Mitrovic. We've got some quotes to bring you from Tony Khan, who's the director of football here at Fulham. He's really excited. He says, I'm delighted to welcome Sasha to Fulham. He's a talented and a versatile midfielder who we followed for many years. He says his arrival will strengthen our team and I know that he will flourish under the great coaching of Marco Silva. So one in for sure, a second almost here at Fulham. And we do have two departures to bring you as well. Nathaniel Chalabar, he's left Fulham today. He's gone to West Brom and it's Joshua on he also left the club earlier today by mutual consent. His contract terminated by, by both parties and he has since signed for Preston North End. So two out and two almost in. Cedric Suarez, that deal is almost done. It's indeed, Ellie Roper with news on Fulham. Let's bring you some breaking news regarding uh, Leicester City winger Mark Albrighton. Looks like he could be on his way out of the club this evening. He is in the West Midlands and he is having chats with West Brom about a possible last-minute loan deal. Uh, Albrighton, one of just three remaining Leicester players from their Premier League title-winning squad of uh, 2016. Vardy and Amati, the other two, for the record. Uh, he's only started one Premier League game all season. He's 33 now, apparently wants more regular football at this stage of his career, and he is having talks with West Brom about a loan deal tonight. We've been told it's his choice to leave at this point, uh, but his Leicester contract still runs until the summer of 2024. Uh, so not necessarily the end of his Leicester career at this point, but he wants to be playing football, and that could be at West Brom for the rest of the season. Talks taking place uh, right now. Let's right now, though, head back to the uh, Carabao Cup semi final with just over 10 minutes to go it's still Newcastle 2-1 up against Southampton 3-1 up on aggregate so the onus on Southampton they need two goals both keepers in the last couple of minutes Michael making key saves. Yeah re really good Jules a great bit of play from Southampton as well and Adam Armstrong will be absolutely gutted he does it in the back of the net. Lavia said since he's come on in the second half he's been magnificent picks a ball up just inside the, his, uh, the Newcastle half and he's, he puts his ball through the eye of a needle I'm not too sure what the Newcastle defenders Adam Armstrong runs from the left takes a touch and the Newcastle defenders are thankful they've got Nick Pope he just flies out of his box and Adam Armstrong goes just to dink it over him but it's a great block from Nick Pope they're thankful they've got him in the net otherwise it would have been two all and at the other end uh, Newcastle had a free kick and they were asking for a f penalty went to VAR it wasn't it was a long ball Sven Botman knocks it down he knocks it onto uh, Sally Sue from the clearance, he goes to the edge of the probably 25 yards out and it's Sean Longstaff. Longstaff. He nearly has a hat-trick. It's an incredible strike, technique, right foot, and Bazunu makes a, a great save. Southampton uh, have been the better of the two teams in this second half, but it's still... 2-1 Newcastle and we're coming into the final 10 minutes, Jules. Yeah, they're just over 10 minutes away from their first cup final since 1999. The closing stage is alive. If you want, over on Sky Sports Football, we're going to get back to the transfers and back to that Leicester City story I just brought you on a potential departure. Kirsty Edwards, we can go live to now to bring you more on that. Kirsty. Yeah, it's come as a, a bit of a surprise, this one, hasn't it? We knew that Leicester were prepared to to see a couple of their more fringe players leave during this window, but uh, Mark Brighton's name has not cropped up when we've been talking about those players. We have seen Iosu Perez uh, leave today on loan to Real Betis. He was the one, one of the ones we were talking about, and we understood that uh, Leicester were prepared to let go. But I think 
Mark Brighton just wants to play football. He's still 33. He ha he's been finding game time a bit restricted here this season at Leicester, although he did come off the bench in their last Premier League game against Brighton and actually scored in that two-all draw as well. But he wants to play more football. This opportunity has arisen with uh, West Brom coming in with this very late move today on deadline day. He's over there now. In talks, the club have uh, allowed him to go there. It's really up to him whether he decides to make the move. So after joining Leicester City in 2014, he was part of that title-winning side. If he goes, it will mean there'll be only two of that side uh, still here remaining at Leicester um, with Vardy and uh, Armati. So, yeah... One to keep across, not long to go, but uh, Mark Brighton having talks with West Brom and we're still waiting as well, still waiting on confirmation over whether Harry Souter has made his move here to Leicester from Stoke City. So we'll keep you up to date with that in the wind. Kirsty, thanks wow. so much indeed. We're going to go straight back to Michael. Wow, he says, because Newcastle have eight minutes between them and Wembley, but they're going to play the remaining eight minutes with ten men. What's just happened? They're going to be backs against wall now. Bruno Gomerez, Samuel Dorsey, very tricky, tricky player. He goes, he goes into middle, middle, middle of the field and he chops right and his left foot is planted. Bruno Gomerez stands on his ankle. Paul Taney give it first initial sight, he give a yellow card. And then it goes to VAR. I'm seeing it again now in slow motion. He takes a right, touch to the left. Then he gets his left foot, plants it. Yeah, it's, it's a red card. When you sit in slow motion, you always slow it down. It looks awful. But you hear his oh, foot's wow. planted and he just stands straight on him. Uh, Paul Tin, as soon as he goes over to VAR, he doesn't think twice. The yellow card is rescinded and it's straight to a red card. And now we're going to the final eight minutes and Newcastle are down to, to ten men. Uh, well, Bruno looks unhappy with the decision, but I'd be very surprised if Eddie Howe tries to defend that uh, at the end of the game. It's a red card for Bruno Gemaresh. Will it affect the outcome of this game as Southampton line up a free kick? You'll see that over on Sky Sports Football. Back to our panel here in the studio very shortly indeed. It's an 11pm deadline in England. It's midnight in Scotland and Rangers have already signed Nicholas Raskin from Standard Liège. We will be off live to Glasgow for you next.
We do have some breaking news on another deal done, and it's for Nottingham Forest. As you can see, they've completed the deal for Felipe. Andy Brassel's going to talk about that in just a moment. Let's go live to Rob Dorsey. I don't know whether it's you or Nottingham Forest fans that wanted this more right now, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, the Forest have had three deals on the go. This is one over the line. We're still waiting to hear about John Joe Shelby. We're still waiting to hear about Kayla Navas, the Paris Saint-Germain goalkeeper. Can they get those deals over the line with an hour and a quarter, less than an hour and a quarter of this window remaining? But one is over the line. We can show you... The Felipe leaving the Nottingham Forest training ground in the last 15 minutes or so. You can see, when you see those pictures, of a, a big smile on his face as he gave us a wave from the back seat of that car. Felipe is a Nottingham Forest player. They've completed a move uh, for him from Atletico Madrid. He's, it's an undisclosed fee. Not a big fee, I understand, because he did have only uh, uh, five months left on his existing Atletico contract, but he signed a one-and-a-half-year deal uh, with Nottingham Forest. 30 33-year-old Brazilian centre-back uh, brings a vast majority of experience, a, a great deal of experience to that Nottingham Forest defence, but he hasn't played an awful lot of football. Um, he's not started a La Liga game for Atletico since early November, so is he ready to go straight into that Nottingham Forest starting 11? That's a question for Steve Cooper over the coming days, but that's one over the line. Forest still hope to get two more over the line in the next hour or so. Stay with us. Rob, you've been working for the last 12 or 13 hours. Well done, putting in the shift there for us. OK, Andy, let's talk about this uh, fella Felipe, because my memory serves me, if it serves me right, Champions League games didn't serve him very well way back. I think playing against Liverpool, didn't he pick up a, a red and then he got a couple of yellows against Manchester? He's quite, quite the player, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's quite combustible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think it's fair to say. OK. He's, he's, he's tough, he's authoritative, he's, mm -hmm. he's a real leader, he, he doesn't muck about. I think the point that Rob made about him not playing that often this season is, is, is worth making. I mean, he's 34 <laughs> in um, May. He's, st he's still fit, pretty fit, considering. Okay. And he is used to playing at really high level. He was great for Porto before he turned up at, at Atletico. But, you know, I, I think when you're a defender, it's the hardest position to adapt to the Premier League mm. because everything happens at 100 miles an hour. Sam. And it's a lot to deal with. I think Sam. you can have a few bad games at the beginning and then people start to write you off pretty quickly. I mean, mm. we can think of great defenders in Premier League history who've struggled to adapt straight away. Nemanja Vidic, Patrice Evra, players like that who had really nightmarish starts. Yeah, you make can fine. Forrest afford that? I think that's the question you really have to ask. So... It's going to be a, a big period of adaptation to him. Of course, it's going to be next to Renan Lodi. If he plays, of course, they're used to playing together. So maybe he can talk him through the game. They share a common language, Portuguese, so maybe that can help a little bit. Um, but, I mean, I think he might need a bit of time that Forrest perhaps don't, don't have. have. OK. All right. OK, thanks for now, Andy. Let's go back to Jules. Some breaking news, Jules. Uh, yeah, breaking news to bring you from Bournemouth. Uh, as they say on their Twitter, another one through the door. It is, as you'll see uh, in the yellow on your screen there, Hamid Traore. This was expected. He's become their sixth signing of what is a very productive January window. Joining from uh, Sassuolo in Serie A. It's an initial loan agreement which will become permanent in the summer for a further five years. A couple of hours ago, they signed um, Ukraine international Ilya Zabani. He became the club's first deadline day addition from Dinamo Kiev. And now they have brought in Ahmed Traore. So doing all they can to ensure that Bournemouth will be staying in the Premier League this season. Signing number six uh, for them. And just the line to bring you, just uh, handed to us by our man Vinny O'Connor, who's covering Everton tonight and has been there all day long on what could have been a, a busy day of transfers for Sean Dyche and Everton. The news is from Vinny that Sean Dyche himself has just left Everton's Finch Farm training ground. Read into that what you will. The director of football, Kevin Thelwell, is still there inside with the club's media team is the news we are hearing. Whether that is uh, wishful thinking or whether they're working on something, Sean Dyche is no longer there. Everton trying to bolster their squad before the 11pm deadline, 12pm deadline, midnight for Scottish sides to get any deadline deals done. Rangers have completed the signing of Nicholas Raskin, uh, midfielder from Standard Liège. Let's get more details on that and uh, whatever else is happening with reporter Mark Benstead. He's in Glasgow to bring us lots more. Hi there, Mark.
Evening, Jules. Yeah, it's been steady, if not spectacular, here in Scotland so far on deadline day. That Raskin deal at Rangers, probably the standout bit of business so far. He's the second edition in this January window and the final edition as well. He's a Belgian under-21 international midfielder. He can play in the sixth position, in the eighth position. He's faced Rangers, of course, in his time at Standard Liège as well in Europe a couple of years ago, three years ago, in fact. Uh, and he's an acquisition that Michael Bill was really quick keen to bring in. I say that's the end of their business. He'll be the last name in. They will now turn their attention to bringing in further signings in the summer transfer window as Beale puts his stamp on the group. Uh, elsewhere, no new arrivals in at Celtic today. They got the business done early in this window. Four new faces brought in already. Uh, Oliver Abelgaard's time at the club is over, though. He only arrived in the last transfer window, but struggled to make an impact. Just nine appearances, all as a substitute. He has moved to Hellas Verona. Uh, elsewhere in Scotland, Simon Murray has joined Ross County from Queen's Park. He's helped the Spiders to uh, a couple of promotions over the last few seasons, helped them climb the divisions. He's got 18 goals so far this season. He's moved north to help bolster County's attacking options. Uh, Connor Shields has moved from Motherwell to Queen's Park to kind of fill his boots in a, in a forward role. Uh, elsewhere, a lot of speculation going into the day around Hibernian. We're going to try for Josh Campbell earlier. There was a lot of talk about Kevin Nisbet maybe generating bids. Uh, both actually started for Hibs tonight in their game up at Ross County, so both it would have appear are going nowhere. Uh, Hibbs actually got a deal done during the game. They announced a signing at half-time. They brought in Matthew Hoppy, the US international forward on loan from Middlesbrough. Elsewhere, a busy day at St Mirren, a couple in, a couple out. Ethan Erehan has joined Lincoln City. Dylan Reed's gone to Crystal Palace. They brought in Thierry Small, the 18-year-old wing-back from Southampton, on loan. And Tony Watt will arrive shortly. We're told that deal is imminent. He'll join on loan from Dundee United. A quick word on Dundee United. Just finally, they should get a windfall if that Harry Suter deal comes through. They have a sell-on clause. That should get them around about £3 million. Uh, still a couple of hours to go, though, here in Scotland for other deals to happen. Mark Benson, thanks very much indeed. Uh, we've got about 30 seconds to talk Everton. That's probably all it needs, really, because there are no signings so far. I mean, Chris, new manager in the door. Can you quite believe they've not got any deals done yet? No, um, and I think it makes it worse when they, you know you look about the teams down there that are fighting for um, survival as well, and they've been spending money trying to um, improve, obviously improve their squad. Um, I'm, you know, I'm sure Sean Dyche would have wanted players in. There's no doubt about that. Um, but listen, if it's not to be, um, you know, Clinton's told us all season they've got a good enough squad to stay up anyway. <laughs> Is that right, friend? <laughs> I did, yeah. I could, yeah. I, I just want to. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hope they stay up. I do hope they stay up. I, just love, I would love one or two players to come in. Well, listen, one hour, five minutes still to go for Everton and the rest of the teams in England to get their business done. It is not over yet, and maybe when Big Ben bongs at 11 o'clock tonight, there will be a new face through the Everton door. <laughs> maybe by then, Enzo Fernandez will be a Chelsea player. Maybe by then, Pedro Porro will have signed for Spurs. Maybe by then, Marcel. Well, Sabitzer will be off to Manchester United. Just over an hour to go until the window closes.
means there is just one hour to go until the transfer window shuts in England. Will Chelsea break the British record for Enzo Fernandez? Will Manchester United clinch a late deal for Marcel Sabitzer? And will Tottenham finally, finally sign Pedro Porro? Yeah, we'll be live up and down the country to our reporters with the very latest, with dozens of Premier League deals still to be done. Arsenal have landed a big one, though. We'll hear from their new midfielder, Jorginho, as he's walked in the door. But their title rivals, Manchester City, have let go of Jao Cancelo. But Bernardo Silva is staying. Uh, let's start this hour with some breaking news. It regards one of the departures from Tottenham. It's Matt Doherty. We've been telling you he was all set to leave on loan for Atletico Madrid. He is leaving Tottenham. He's not leaving on loan because Spurs have just announced they have mutually agreed to the termination of Doherty's contract. Michael Bridge uh, can tell us more now. Um, Michael, there's a few heads being scratched in here. What do you know? So's mine. <laughs> no, I mean... This, this is unbelievable. Um, well, firstly, Matt Doherty is an Atletico Madrid player. Now, we expected this to be a loan deal, which we reported this morning. Now, this is just in. Now, I'm just about getting confirmation. I understand it's to do with a FIFA loan limit. Now, Tottenham have got, let me, let me think, Jed Spence, Sergio Reguilón, Harry Winks, Giovanni Lo Celso, Tanguy Ndombele, Destiny Adogo, Giovanni Lo Celso, I've counted him twice. Joe Roden, so I think that's enough. Jed Spence, yeah, so it's, it's the FIFA limit of around eight. But more on that as I get it, because obviously this is just breaking news. But I think this is the issue here, and that's why Spurs have mutually cancelled his contract for him to go to Atletico Madrid to seal, which I think is a dream move for him. But, wow. I mean, I mean, I did not expect that. But that's why I think this is, this is the case at the moment. It's to put a, a FIFA limit a loan international loan i've never really heard of that before if i'm honest with you but wow but yeah spurs have loaned a lot out I've, I've, we've saying all day how many players spurs have actually got out on loan and they'll all be back july the first tell you won't be back though matt doherty atletico madrid player wow michael thanks very much he was lifting off all the players they had not enough fingers if he'd still had his hot water bottle in his hand so we had to put it down thanks very much indeed michael <laughs> 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 right, uh, let's get from Tottenham to Manchester then because let's get some more news on Marcel Sabitza. Ben Ransom is up there for us at the moment. Uh, we've seen him land, we've seen him, uh, but what is happening to him right now? Tell us more, Ben. <laughs> yeah, it's been a frantic few hours here at Manchester United, hasn't it? I was here at midday inside the Carrington training complex. We were chatting with Eric Ten Hag. He was doing his news conference. He was telling us then that it was unlikely and very difficult to, for Manchester United to find a replacement for Christian Eriksen this late in the window. Fast forward to where we are now with an hour of the window and the deadline still remaining, and we are ever closer to... A signing, Marcel Sabitz, you're absolutely spot on. Our colleagues at Sky Germany uh, saw him go to the airport, board a plane. He touched down in Manchester here just before 8 o'clock this evening. Some 20 minutes or so later, we saw him in a black people carrier in a convoy driving into the, the gates here at Carrington. He needed to do his medical. He needed to finish off the finalise the final parts of his move. And he needed to do all the usual club media, the, the, the photos and the videos and the announcements and all that sort of stuff. Now. Where are we right now? Well, as far as I'm aware, he's over in the main first team building here. He's been here now for a couple of hours. He's had something to eat, I can tell you that much, uh, which suggests to me that he doesn't believe there's going to be any issues with this deal going through because you wouldn't eat if you were stressed. So Manchester United are getting closer to this deal. The club have always been optimistic they'd be able to seal this signing in time before that 11 o'clock deadline. We're just waiting for confirmation that the medical has been passed. We're waiting for confirmation uh, that the deal has been agreed, this loan deal, to bring him here until the end of the season. And then Manchester United can announce Marcel Sabitzer officially as a United player. As the clock ticks on, though, we just get a little bit more anxious, don't we? And it just ratchets up a little bit and a little bit more. But as things stand, the club very confident and we're waiting for that confirmation here. And hopefully we'll get it before the 11 o'clock deadline because we don't want to talk about deal sheets just yet, do we? Oh, we don't want to go down the deal sheet route just yet. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat>
Uh, not quite done yet, but Marcel Sabitzer on his way to Manchester United. Um, guys, Clinton, let's come to you first. How, how good a replacement will he be for the injured Ericsson, do you think? Very good. You know, how good I spoke about it a few hours ago. When he praised me, no, nah, Sabitzer is <laughs> um, a top player. I, I liked him. I liked him at RB Leipzig. Obviously, he went to Bayern Munich. Hasn't played him much because he's got two exceptional midfielders ahead of him, but I think he'd be a good signing, a really good signing for Man United. A lot of people say, well, why he's not getting in that Bayern Munich team? Well, Kimmich and Goretzka are two really good players and play, yeah, played a lot of football together. So he hasn't played the minutes that he's played. He's still made a, a lot of appearance, many of them coming from the bench. But I think he'd be an important player. Listen, any team's going to miss Christian Eriksen. But if you can bring another midfield in there to complement the good midfielders you have at Man United already, I think Man United would be a good signing. I mean, I mean, so he really is. Eriksen has, has been making Manchester United tick, as he does any team he, he plays for. They've been going so well. They've had this head of steam up. Is there any danger that losing Eriksen now, possibly for as long as May, even with Sabitzer coming in, could derail United? They'll be hoping not, um, because I, I think you can see that they are evolving under Ten Hag, and, and I think you can see on and off the field. I love what Ten Hag's done. I think you know he's, he's setting standards off the field, but on the field, you, you can just see they're starting to play the way that he wants them to play, and I think that transformation in the in the midfield area with Ericsson and, and Casemiro, Fernandez in front, they've been brilliant. So of course taking one of those out of there it's bound to have a you know an impact and I think that's why they've looked at okay who can we bring in and, and I think Sabitza will you know he needs to, to come in and fit in quickly but I think the fact that he can score goals, he can assist. He's certainly going to sort of benefit because it is such a blow. I think when, when you are sort of evolving and, and you can see that they, they've got this real good combination in that midfield area, to then lose one of them, it is a, it is a blow. It's interesting, isn't it, Chris? It's such an important window, this, with the, the final run-in to come in the next few months. And, and all these big sides towards the top of the Premier League are bringing in midfielders. It seems to be an area that they're all looking to, to really strengthen at the moment. Yeah, I'm thinking because, Chelsea, I'm thinking yeah, Arsenal, I'm thinking Manchester United. Well, it's not a coincidence. I, think I've, I mean, I've sat here plenty of times and said that though there's a shortage of strikers worldwide um, and it's only going to get worse. Um, you know, I think you know, a lot of teams are looking to strengthen in that area. A lot of you know, teams' threats come from the wide areas and a lot of them, you know, when you think of some of the, the squads, Chelsea, Man United, um, Arsenal as well, you know, in terms of those wide type of players, you know, they're, they're, <coughs> they've, they've got loads of them, they're bloated in the wide areas. So... Um, you know, it's not a surprise. A lot of them are playing, you know, with three in the middle of the pitch now as well, with one striker. But, you know, it's, it's. I think managers will tell you, you know, you know that midfield area, whether it's somebody sitting, whether it's box to box, whether it's, you know, a, a ten. You can't have um, too many of them, um, because you know, with the amount of games that the top teams are playing, you're always chopping and changing. And um, you know, the, the, the thing is, if you bring in quality, they'll find a way to get in the team anyway. And it helps, it helps the training. You know yourself, if you've got bodies there, the training is at a standard where, you know, if you're not playing and training is at a standard, when you are given an opportunity, you're at the level ready to step in. Chelsea are willing to break the British record for a new midfielder. Are they going to manage to get Enzo Fernandez in in time? I think Vicky's got some news. Well, you say that. I haven't got the news. Carve sonical has got the news, actually. So are they going to do this deal? Look, we told you 20 minutes ago <laughs> that the talks were moving in the right direction. Uh, we've now been told that there has been a breakthrough in the talks. Uh, there is the broad outline of an agreement between the two clubs. And now it is a race against time to get this deal done. But it has been agreed in principle between Benfica and Chelsea. It is going to be a record, British record deal, if it goes through. Chelsea have agreed to pay the release clause, 120 million euros, it is £105.4 million. It was getting held up because of arguments about how it was going to be paid, whether it was going to be paid over five years or two years. Just given in, then, do you think? Well, I, I'm not sure exactly. Okay. What we're being told, though, is that there has been a breakthrough and it looks like this deal is now going to be done. It is the biggest ever deal in the history of British football. And this takes Chelsea's spending to... Beyond the ramps, I have to use my fingers and toes to care how much they've spent. I mean, I don't know where to start about mm. how much money Chelsea have spent. People will not believe this. Chelsea have spent more money on transfers than all the other clubs in the major European leagues put together. I'm talking Germany, Spain, Italy, France... All those clubs combined, Chelsea have spent more than them. Chelsea, since the new American owners have come in, have spent almost £600 million on new players. £600 million. You could have 
gone out and bought yourself another Premier League club. You could have bought West Ham for £600 million. Wow. They've gone out and bought 16, 17 players, I think it is. And some people would say they didn't even need to sign all these players mm. because when the Americans bought the club, they were the reigning club world champions. They still are the reigning world club champions for at least another uh, two or three weeks. But the American owners have come in. They want to turbocharge Chelsea. They want to make Chelsea not just the biggest club in the world, but the biggest club group in the world because they want to own clubs all around the world as well. And they don't want to waste any time. They want to make Chelsea bigger than Real Madrid, bigger than the City football group. And they want to make sure that the investment they've made, two and a half billion pounds, is in a matter of years going to be worth five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten billion pounds. And they think the best way to do it is to go out and buy the best young players in the world. But with all these players coming in, they're going to have to get rid of players. We can't talk about that now. We've got to go back to Jules because there has been a result in the Carabao Cup. Let's go to him now and then we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, Vicky, thanks very much indeed. Yeah, Chelsea runners-up in the Carabao Cup final last season. Newcastle are through to this season's Carabao Cup. They've beaten uh, Southampton 2-1 on the night, 3-1 on aggregate. Michael Dawson watched it here in the, the studio while all of the transfers were happening as well. Michael, at 2-0 up inside 20 minutes, it looked like they were cruising through it. It wasn't quite that straightforward in the end, was it? Definitely not. The second half from, from Southampton was, was very, very good. The way Newcastle started on the front foot, taking the 1-0 lead leading on aggregate into this game. St James's Park was rocking. It was absolutely electric. And that's how they started the game. 2-0 two, two up, goals from Sean uh, Longstaff. Brilliant goals as well. Really, really were. And his first one, Trippier does brilliant down the right. And he just finds him, he just glides into the box, takes a touch on his left foot, and he just hits the ball straight across Bazunu. He has absolutely no chance. And the, the second one, I mean, they give the ball away in, in periods of the game, Southampton, in the first half. The they were all over the place um, and his second goal he just broke down the left Joe Linton and um, w was brilliant passes the ball in Almiron pulled back and it's a tap in two goals you don't expect for him you really don't but he was brilliant and then from then the game changed I, I thought I said, I said in uh, coverage the Georgians are going to have the, the, the hotels booked tickets are going to be on order however that changed uh, poor giveaway um, in their own half, it was disappointing. They were in control of the ball, and he turned it, turned it over. I mean, the ball from Chad, uh, the goal from Chad was absolutely unbelievable. I think he touched the ball seven or eight times in the first half. Two was from a kickoff, but the third, the third one, his touch, left foot, and the strike uh, straight across Pope. It was magnificent. He had absolutely no chance. In the second half. Southampton were far the better team. Just a final word on the Bruno red card. He will play in the final, but it's a three-match ban for him. Yeah, he misses the Premier League, so he's looking at not only two Premier Leagues, otherwise he would miss a final. <coughs> James is going to miss his West Ham, Bournemouth and Liverpool. For Newcastle and the Geordies, they'll be delighted they're going to have him back for the final. And we'll see tomorrow night, is it going to be Manchester United or Nottingham Forest? Time will tell. Yeah, Newcastle through to their first League Cup final for 47 years. Michael, thank you very much uh, <laughs> indeed. Uh, John Joe Shelby was in the crowd at St James's Park, but he's all set to become a Nottingham Forest player. Let's head off to Forest now. Rob Dorset is covering them and see what's happening. He's at their training ground. Hi, Rob. Hi, Jules. Look, they turned all the lights off behind us. It must be getting close to that 11 o'clock deadline. But whilst most of the playing staff and the support staff have gone, the administrators haven't, the club's recruitment staff haven't. And yes, John Joe Shelby, we expect to be confirmed by both Newcastle and Nottingham Forest as a Forest player in the next half an hour, 45 minutes maybe. I think they were waiting until the final whistle at uh, St James's Park tonight before they made any announcements. So we'll wait to see if that one happens. But one deal that is done for Nottingham Forest, and Michael Dawson will want to hear this, it's another centre-back following in the footsteps of Dawson who was here in Nottingham a good few years ago now. And it's Felipe, 33 years old, the Brazilian. We got some shots of him in the last 15 minutes leaving the training ground here. You'll uh, see that uh, he, he, he pulls away in one of the official club cars and uh, gives us a little wave as he uh, winds down that back window, as he did earlier on in the day, in truth, when he was heading out to undergo his medal. We've been, uh, medical. We've been with him every step of the way. There is Felipe. Looks a very happy man, doesn't he? Because he signed a one-and-a-half-year contract uh, with Nottingham Forest. Uh, hasn't played much, you have to say, uh, for Atletico Madrid this season. Hasn't 
started our La Liga game since early November. And that's a bit of a theme for the players that Forrest are targeting on this very busy deadline day for them. We mentioned John Joe Shelby, only six months left on his Newcastle contract. He's not started a single Premier League game this season. Hungry, a little bit injured at the moment, you have to say, but could be a big player for Steve Cooper. The third player, I expect this one to go right to the 11 o'clock deadline. Nottingham Forest are chasing the PSG goalkeeper, Kalen Navas. Hugely experienced, this player. Won three Champions League titles in his career, but hasn't played a single game in uh, Ligue 1 for Paris Saint-Germain this season. Forrest saw an opportunity. It looked like it was dead in the water midway through this afternoon because of the price of his wages. They've come to a compromise, but he's still in Paris. Can they get that one over the line in the next 45 minutes or so? Let's see. We'll keep you posted. Rob Dorsett, thanks very much. We have some big, big breaking news. Carvey, what you got? Yeah, we told you uh, a few minutes ago that the deal for Enzo Fernandez uh, to move from Benfica to Chelsea had been agreed in principle. I just got a message from somebody who's involved in the negotiations and he's telling me that the deal has actually been agreed. Wow. And he's saying that the deal was agreed an hour ago. So uh, that tells you how long it takes for us to get the information yeah. and uh, other journalists out there who are working very, very hard today to get the information. But what I'm being told is the deal was agreed within the last hour and as long as everything's done in time, Enzo Fernandez will be a Chelsea player, their number one midfield target, the player they've wanted all along. The player himself has also wanted to move to Stamford Bridge, although Benfica have made it very, very difficult for Chelsea. Uh, they're well within their rights. There was a release mm. clause and Chelsea have agreed to pay that release clause in a way which satisfies uh, Benfica. So as long as it is all sorted before the deadline, he will be uh, a Chelsea player. So he comes in for Graham Potter. That's what, seven, eight? Oh, that's eight. Uh, that, is, the that is their eighth signing, signing of, this, of window. this window. It will take their spending uh, to £290 million in this window. So I think uh, that equates to more than half of the spending by all the clubs in the Premier League has been done by Chelsea. And as I said a few minutes ago, Chelsea have spent more money than all the clubs in the big leagues in Europe combined. Staggering what they're doing in the transfer market, not just this month, but of course last summer as well. When Todd Bowley wants a player, he gets a player. In a way, it's quite easy being a, a, a reporter covering Chelsea when it comes to transfers under these new owners because virtually every player they want, they end up getting. Normally, when you cover mm. a club, some deals don't happen. They fall by the wayside. The club won't pay the asking price. But Chelsea are relentless and yeah. they have the money to be able to sign uh, the players that they want. And that is exactly what they've gone out and done. We thought the Mudrick deal was amazing an amazing amount of money to pay for a player, but they've just smashed the uh, British transfer uh, record to sign a player who, a few months ago, last summer, he was moving for £10 million pounds yeah, incredible. from River Plate to Benfica. And I think uh, they will be very, very delighted at River Plate as well because they've got a 25% sell-on clause. Uh, so they stand to make... I'll have to get my calculator out, uh, <laughs> depending on the profit from the deal for them, uh, probably around £20, £25 million. Pounds. Brilliant news for everyone. It is less Brilliant. than like 45 minutes now to get all of the paperwork done. They have to get it done by 11 o'clock, obviously, and if they're finding that they're not quite getting it all done by 11 o'clock, then they can still put that deal sheet in before 11, and then they have to uh, comply with the FIFA transfer matching system, so then they'll have until midnight to complete all of that paperwork. But... Carvey said it was done in the last hour. You would think now it's trending towards a positive outcome for, for Chelsea and Enzo Fernandes. Yeah. And one thing Chelsea have got to sort out before the Champions League game is trimming their Champions League squad uh, because now they've got too many players yeah, they've got to trim uh, it down. for that squad. So I think it's something like two, three players they've got to cut from that squad yeah. uh, before, I think, the next couple of days they've yeah. got to sort that out as well. It's a big problem for Graham Potter, but they do have their man, says Carvey. That deal is over the line. Right, the clock is ticking, but Arsenal have got their man as well. They've signed Jorginho for £12 million from guess who? Chelsea.
36 minutes left in the transfer window. Let's go off to Leicester, still awaiting the signing of Harry Souter tonight. Uh, Kirsty Edwards, is it nearly done? Well, I hope so. I mean, this, you know, this has been going on all day now. It was this morning we revealed that Leicester had agreed a deal with Stoke. £15 million pounds plus add-ons for Harry Souter. He's been undergoing a medical, talking uh, personal terms. And, uh, yeah, I expected an announcement, but uh, we're still waiting. I'm not told there's any issues. So I think it's just one of those that uh, we're going to have to wait. Hopefully, before close of play, that will get over the line. Um, um, something else that we're waiting to hear on as well, Mark Brighton, of course, discussing uh, with West Brom over a possible loan move there. Very popular figure here, been here for a long time, part of their title winning team, um, but he wants to play more football. So he's over there discussing terms with them. So we're waiting on that one. Uh, of course, one thing confirmed earlier today, Iose Perez uh, is uh, departing the club on loan to Real Betis. That one is confirmed. He's going there till the end of the season when his contract runs out here. Anyway, um, Leicester did sign a player earlier today, a young Ghanaian striker, um, Nathan Apoku. He's gone straight out on loan, though, to Leicester's sister club over in uh, Belgium, OH uh, Leuven. So one for the future there. So, yeah, we're still waiting. Brendan Rodgers, at the start of this transfer window, said that he wanted three positions in particular to fill. He wanted a left-back. Uh, he's got that. He wanted a winger. He's brought one in. Um, we're still waiting on the centre-back, though. That was the other position. But it very much looks like it will be Harry Souter from Stoke. We're just waiting for it to get over the line, hopefully soon. Thanks, Kirsty. Yeah, Dundee United waiting for it to get over the line because Chris has just pointed out to me they've got a sell-on clause for, and they could net about £3 million as soon as that suitor deal gets over the line. So it could be a very good night for Dundee United as well. It's already been a good night for Arsenal. They've signed Jorginho from Chelsea. Let's head off to the Emirates and catch up again with Gail Davis. Yeah, very good evening. Arsenal have a new number 20 confirmed after about 8 o'clock this evening. We'd seen a couple of pictures earlier on in the day and we knew, didn't we, the last few weeks Mikel Arteta's talked about strengthening that midfield. It wasn't perhaps the name that many of the Arsenal fans had maybe hoped to see in, but Arteta was delighted with the signature of the Chelsea midfielder. Remember, he's a uh, winner in the Champions League. He won the Euros with Italy, brings some real leadership into this squad. Very, very young squad. And, and perhaps more importantly, just bolsters that midfield. Earlier today, Mohamed El Nenny announced that he's got a very significant injury. Uh, he had to have an operation on his knee. We know that Xhaka and Party have been instrumental in Arsenal's midfield. But beyond that, not much cover. So Arteta wanted to bring a midfielder on this final day. And he got one. And, and you wonder, don't you, Paul Merson, particularly excited when he spoke about him earlier. Could this be the difference? Could this be the signing that pushes Arsenal towards that first Premier League title in almost 20 years? Gail, thanks very much indeed. Off to Southampton we go now. They've been knocked out of the EFL Cup in the semi-final tonight. Let's head to Mark McAdam, though. Mark, can you maybe give the, uh, the Southampton fans a, a lift by announcing a new record signing? I can certainly do that. They have been working tirelessly whilst preparing for that League Cup semi-final at Newcastle. We've heard from Nathan Jones over the course of the last few weeks who said he's been desperate to add to their attack. He wants more potency. He wants players that can play on the front foot. And the good news for Southampton fans, despite being knocked out of the cup, is that they have added to their squad today. They've spent around £45 million in bringing two new faces into the club as well. We'll start with the one that got confirmed to us a little bit earlier on today. Uh, Kamal Dean Suleimana from Wren. Now, this is the deal that potentially could become a club record transfer fee paid. It all depends on the add-ons, but the guaranteed money that Southampton will be paying Wren is around £22 million. The add-ons could take it to well in excess of £25 million, which would become a club record fee for the 20-year-old. He played two matches for Ghana in the World Cup as well, so he brings that pedigree with him, uh, and he's someone that can play as an inside forward on the left, on the right, potentially 
potentially through the middle or in that 10 role. So he definitely adds an attacking option for Nathan Jones. Uh, and another player that we are yet to confirm with the football club on this one, but we know that the deal has been agreed, and that's for Paul Onyoachu from uh, Genk. He's a six-foot, seven-inch striker. He's an out-and-out -out striker. That's exactly what the football club have been looking for. They tried to sign one in the summer window, but they couldn't do that for Ralph Hasenhutl. It was the uh, top of Nathan Jones's wish list as well, and they've managed to supply him with a player that Rasmus Ankerson, the Southampton owner, knows well from his time back at Mitchelland. Uh, so another big acquisition. This one is £18 million pounds plus add-ons. So that takes Southampton spending to £45 million in deadline day alone, uh, as well as the other players they've already signed in this window. So Southampton fans will be disappointed with the fact that they haven't got through to Wembley, but they have got two new faces today, which could prove to be crucial for them as they avoid trying to get relegated from the championship. So a good day's business for the football club uh, and Bournemouth as well. I keep saying this, Bournemouth fans, don't go to bed yet because the club are still working in the background to try and get things done. Uh, so yeah, it could be an interesting time over the course of the next half an hour or so down here at the Vitality Stadium. Mark, thanks. Yeah, it's not over yet for Bournemouth. It's not over yet for Fulham. Closing in on a low move for the uh, Arsenal right-back Cedric Suarez. Eleanor Roper, right across this. Is, is it a done deal yet, Ali? Not yet, no. As you say, closing in, but it is not yet a done deal. We know that Cedric Suarez has been having a medical this evening and we're waiting for final confirmation of his loan move from Arsenal to Fulham. So not yet a, a done deal, but we know that Marco Silva has been after him for some time. This morning it looked as though it might not happen, but Fulham hopeful of closing in on that before 11 o'clock tonight. Now that will, of course, be their second signing of the day. We know that they've already signed the Serbian midfielder Sasha Lukic. That was on a four and a half year deal. Um, we know that the Fulham doctor travelled to Turin yesterday to carry out his medical in Italy. He's returned to the UK today. That's a four and a half year deal and the club will have an option to extend by a further 12 months. But Cedric Suarez almost done. It will have a knock on effect on Shane Duffy who's already with Fulham on loan. Now Premier League rules that means that mean that any club can only have two players on loan from another English side. So he will be moved from a loan deal to a permanent deal. But we're waiting for confirmation of Cedric Suarez becoming a Fulham player. We should have it in the next half hour or so. Thanks so much indeed. Uh, to Everton we go now. We told you half an hour ago or so that Sean Dyche had already left their training ground for the night. Some of the staff was still there. Does it mean that we aren't expecting them to make any late signings? Vinny O'Connor can tell us. Vinny. I suppose there's still that possibility. Director of Football Kevin Thelwell is still here at Finch Farm, as is the club's media team as well. But it's been a story so far today of what might have been another striker coming into the frame. And we understand that Everton showed an interest over the weekend as well is Olivier Giroud. Remember a few years back when Ronald Koeman was in charge, he thought he'd got Olivier Giroud in through the door and that in the end didn't materialise and this isn't going to happen either. Olivier Giroud deciding that his future lies elsewhere. Indeed, if he is going to come back to England, it would be uh, he would welcome a move to London rather than a, a move to Merseyside, we understand. So that's the situation as regards that. Beto Udinese was a, another one that Everton made an inquiry about. Uh, Udinese obviously don't want to sell. He's scored, what, 18 goals in, in 50 appearances. Um, and effectively, he's been priced out of Everton's range. Uh, Sulemana, we know, not happening as well. He was obviously looking to get his move to Southampton. Jokerez, also we were told early on today that that was a move that wasn't going to materialise. So... Everton's owner, Fahad Mashiri, had promised in an interview with the fans' advisory board that he was going to get a striker in, that Everton would end this window stronger. Uh, they would be stronger in the second half of the season. Well, as it stands, they're a man light, effectively, a side that has lost eight of the last ten in all competitions, with Anthony Gordon having left the club. They haven't brought in a replacement for him, and it was recognised beforehand that they needed to get at least two more attacking options in during this transfer window. So a quiet night on the Everton front, it looks like. For now, Vinny, thank you very much indeed. Uh, but a reminder of the, the breaking news in the last few minutes. It's a breakthrough for Chelsea. They have reached an agreement with Benfica for the transfer of Enzo Fernandez. But will they get the deal done before the deadline? 26 minutes left. We're live to Stamford Bridge next.
Okay, let's bring you right up to date with this situation with Enzo Fernandez because you may remember that Carve Solokol told us that a deal had been reached, an agreement between Benfica and Chelsea. Let's get more on this with Paul Gilmore, who is at Stamford Bridge for us. So, Paul, is the deal going to get done in time? Because it's not quite there yet. <laughs> Not quite. They've done the hard bit, though, and that has been to find an agreement on all sides, really, about the structure and the form of payment uh, that it will take to make Enzo Fernandez the British record transfer holder, £105 million, eclipsing Jack Grealish, of course, when he moved to Manchester City. So the difficult bit done uh, with that, though, comes another little problem. I say little problem. It's done with one hour left of uh, to go so it's all about getting that paperwork in and there's a mad uh, rush behind the scenes just to make sure that is all done but that said I would be hugely surprised uh, I think the the feeling seems to be that this will get done I'd be hugely surprised if anything fell apart from here they've got the difficult part done it's trying to get this paperwork over the line early indications from Portugal suggesting that Fernandes will sign a contract until 2031 keeping uh, in tune with some of the other bright young players that Chelsea have signed in this window, a staggering window really for them. What business they have done, they have made a real statement in this window as they attempt to claw back initially that 10-point gap on Manchester United to get into the Champions League for next season, but certainly looking further ahead and looking into the future, it's what uh, this project is all about at Chelsea. So Enzo Fernandez, £105 million, the deal is all agreed and it is now a race against time to get that paperwork in and make it official as he looks set to come to the Premier League, the World Cup winner. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much. Get back to you very shortly. So Chelsea, very busy. Crystal Palace weren't so busy, but they are, have got a deal, I think. Throughout the whole window, yeah. we've been saying that the Crystal Palace manager, Patrick Vieira, wanted to add physicality to his midfield. For 30 days, they tried and they couldn't sign anyone. Mm. And then on deadline day, they've signed two players. A hammered up from Stuttgart, and it's been rolling across the bottom of the screen in the last half an hour. The one that they did want desperately was Albert Sambi Lukonga okay. from Arsenal. I think Arsenal were willing and open to doing offers once Jorginho had made that move from Stamford Bridge. So Albert Sambi Lukonga is a straight loan. Suits Arsenal, I think, because if he can get regular first-team football... He'll come back in the summer. He'll still have another three years left on his contract. And if Arsenal do want to do business with another club on a permanent deal, then his market value might well have stayed um, in, in a good place. OK, so that's good news for Crystal Palace fans. All right, let's go back to Jules. Yeah, Vicky, thanks very much indeed. Let's talk Leeds now. They brought in uh, USA international Weston McKenney. That happened yesterday. Tim Thornton is uh, anyone going to follow him to Ellen Road in the next, what, 20-odd minutes? Well, it's been a case of one in, one out for Leeds today. We don't expect any more arrivals here tonight. It's Diego Lorente out to AS Roma. He's joined them online with a view to a permanent transfer. And a young defender has come in, Diego Montero. He's signed from the Swiss side, Savet. He's only 18, but he's really highly rated. And Leeds have got big hopes for him. Leeds United fans tonight, though, will be wondering whether Jack Harrison will be remaining as a Leeds player. There's been speculation all day and interest from Leicester City, but Jesse Marsh will get his wish, and he's staying with Leeds United. It's been a good window for Leeds. They broke their trans transfer record uh, earlier on in this window with the capture of uh, Jorginho Ruta. Weston McKenney has come in as well, and uh, Max Verber. So they're in a better place than they were a month ago and ready for the rest of the season. But the big news tonight is that Jack Harrison is staying at Leeds United. Tim, thanks very much indeed. 20 minutes left of this transfer window. Nice to have Big Ben back chiming. Isn't it? has been a few windows without it. All refurbed and ready for the big night, specifically for tonight, of course. 20 minutes to go. When it bongs, the window closes. Stay with us to see which deals will finally get over the line.
Uh, just a matter of minutes, 15 minutes left for EFL clubs to finalise their deals before the 11pm uh, deadline. Lots has been happening today. David Craig can recap the big deals for us. Hi again, David. Yes, Julian, welcome to uh, Preston and EFL headquarters. And, of course, lots of people in football doing the really hard work behind the scenes to make these deals happen. And I'm just going to step out of shot for a second or two. You can see the whole team at the EFL here, led by Nick Craig, who's the gentleman at the back standing up, the chief operating officer. Around about 15 minutes to go for those deals to go through. And some of the deals we believe they're working on, this is the news that's coming out of the club. Burnley, Jules, have made a late bid and signed winger Enoch Ajayi from Andelec, Vincent Company's old team. He's saying signed on a four and a half year deal, but he's going to be loaned back to another Belgian side immediately, Michelin. Big news for Stoke City fans Axel Transaby is uh, down there discussing terms and having a medical on a move from Manchester United. At Charlton Athletic in League One, they've signed former Chelsea defender Michael Hector. West Brom, as Kirsty Edwards to tell you, big news for them and their fans. Mark Albrighton set to join from Leicester City. And news on Ryan Fraser, who, of course, uh, is still a Newcastle United player. Newcastle United booking their place at Wembley tonight in the EFL uh, Carabao Cup final. Ryan Fraser, we did understand, might be moving to Hull City. Other clubs were in for him as well. But at this moment in time, it appears he's going to remain a part of that Newcastle United team. And a little bit of news as well. Just come in, MK Dons. They're close to the signing of Aberdeen captain Anthony Stewart on a permanent deal. But, Jules, as the clock ticked down, this is where the hard work is going on to make sure those deals get across the line before 11 o'clock. The EFL working late in tonight, along with David Craig. Thanks very much indeed, David. Uh, stay with us for all the deals from the EFL uh, from 11 o'clock and beyond. Let's just focus on the, the big deal uh, we are, are waiting for here in the studio. The one <coughs> top the lot, assuming it goes through, and that is Enzo Fernandez to Chelsea from Benfica. We brought you the news earlier that uh, there was a breakthrough, that a deal had been agreed, but it's the case of getting all the paperwork done. It is not yet um, confirmed. Um, Sue, let's start with you. I mean, Chelsea have pushed and pushed and pushed for this guy all month long, ever since he, he started at the World Cup. They're ready to break the British transfer a record for him. Why are they so keen to get him in? Well, they wanted a midfielder, didn't they? Um, and it, I suppose it fits with the, the strategy of buying good, young talent. We saw him at the World Cup and he was superb, wasn't he? Obviously, one young player, won the World Cup himself. But I just think when you watch him, he just reads the game so well. He's, he's an athlete, great passer of the ball. And you just think all of those attributes, he'll fit into that, that Chelsea side, he'll fit into the, the Premier League. So, yeah, they've certainly gone out of their way to, to go and, and bring him in. Uh, 105 million or, or whatever they end up spending for, for him. Clinton, it's a lot of money for a guy that's already started the World Cup, he was the young player of the tournament, but he hasn't played that much really as in top-level football in, in Europe. No, that's why I was surprised about it. You can't tell me, and they can't tell me they're signing him off the back of a World Cup because we've seen loads of players have outstanding World Cup. World Cup's totally different. That's six or seven games. You're coming now to the Premier League where you've got to do it for 38 games. So it's going to be a big step up for him, but he's young. As Sue said, he's talented. He had an outstanding World Cup. And you wish him well. I think, it, I think it'll be a good signing. I do think it was probably signing something like a seven or eight year contract because that's what Chelsea are doing at the moment and you want to tie him down. But if, if they're paying this much money, they must have seen a lot of him, the real deal. They can't just be signing him off the back of a World Cup. But what well, I've seen a few things of him at Benfica. He looks like a really exciting young player, holding midfielder, and that's where they've missed him. If you're going to lose Jorginho, you bring in a younger replacement who's, got, who's much younger. I think it would turn out to be a good signing for Chelsea, but just please don't buy someone off the back of a World Cup. I've seen that happen many a times and then fail in the Premier League. I don't think Fernandes will fail. I think it would be a good signing. Uh, I mean, the age bracket, all these signings, Mudrick, Badia Shields, Santos, Madweki, Dors, Fernandes, all young, young players. How soon before Chelsea become a real force again? Well, they have to hit the ground running. You see where they are in the Premier League. And, and we said when Graham Potter came in, They've got to see a longer-term plan. They can't think instant success, which is a surprise for Chelsea. Todd Bowley is, is seen when you, you sign a lot of young players, we see it at different levels in, in the Premier League, you can't expect them to come to the country to settle in and say we're going to expect to be in the top four. That's probably what Todd Bowley expects when you're paying that kind of money. But Graham Potter needs time. That's something I always say. Give him time. That they made it, all the effort to bring him, his staff. Now they're bringing players in. The moving players on, Kante's been there for long enough, been magnificent, he's getting older, not been a big part of the team this season. Jorginho, 
gone today. And now the younger players that they're bringing in, they're going to take time to, to settle in. And Graham Potter's going to have to work with them and get them improving because where they are in the Premier League at this moment in time is not good enough for Chelsea's owner manager, football club, because they used to winning trophies. I mean, one of the criticisms levelled so far at Graham Potter in his time at Chelsea, Chris, has been that you know he's not settled on a formation, he, he's chopped and changed the team, he's trying to find his best 11. I mean, suddenly throwing seven, eight new signings in isn't exactly going to make that any easier for him, is it? No, it's not, but I mean, I, I think, you know, I think we touched on it earlier that it's going to be a long-term project for Chelsea, there's no doubt, as, as Michael said there as well, you know, there's a few older ones that have had to move on, or they're going to move on. They had to um, revamp the squad. They've done that. They said usually teams take five, six windows to do that. But I think Chelsea have identified that you know, we want to get it done in one or two windows. It gives us a better chance to gel together. And then, I mean, it's safe to say I think this season's a write-off. Um, you know, it's very difficult to say for Chelsea at this moment in time. But you know, in terms of you know, Premier League, are they going to get top four? I doubt it. Um, but they will demand that they come back in the summer. You know, to challenge to win the Premier League. I mean, top four is no good enough for Chelsea. They will demand that they go and push to, um, you know, to win it. Clinton really wants to come in. I'm not going to let no, him because we've got that. breaking news to bring you. Michael Bridge, what can you tell us? Ever seen the film Titanic when Rose says it's been 84 years? That's how it feels here, but they've done it finally. Tottenham have signed Pedro Porro. They've got the right back. They wanted Pedro Porra has joined Tottenham on an initial loan deal with a fee, a potential fee uh, in July. But the deal is now done. Pedro Porro has joined Spurs more at 11 o'clock. But no worries, it's done. Spurs have confirmed. Michael Bridge, thank you very much indeed. It's a done deal. Michael Dawson. <laughs> Pedro Porro, what did you just say to me off air? Well, I said I hope he's better than Pedro Pony. I, I hear a lot of Pedro <laughs> Pony in my parents <laughs> everywhere. Who's had Peppa Pig playing on yeah, the pitch for however many years. Uh, uh, what did you just say, Clinton? The deals took long enough. He, he better be as good as Cafu with how long <laughs> yeah. the deals took, by the way. Yeah. But no, it's a good signing yeah. for Tottenham. They needed a right wing back, having lost Matt Doherty and Jed Spence. So, as I say, good, a good, um, very good player. And they've been chasing him a long time and identified him. So I'm glad it's over the line. Does that mean Bradger can go home now? <laughs> no, no, we're keeping there a bit no. longer. Yeah. I would yeah. send them home. You know what I was going to say about the Chelsea one? Just like, because they're paying a lot of money. The problem is now with Chelsea is that when they want other players, they're just going to put extra 10, 15 million on them because of the, 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 the spending yeah. powers yeah. that, that they've happens. got at the moment. That happens. That does anyway. happen, but it's going to be even more now yeah, because man. imagine that, boy. That's a hundred and near enough 108 million for a midfielder. Yeah. He's a youngster, but don't get me wrong. I think it'd be yeah, a good signing. I think it shows as well when, you know, and Sue touched on it. I mean, they signed them, what, Benfica signed them a year ago for 10 million pounds. Yeah. You know, it shows you, and I know... You know, the scouting system probably in the UK is as good as anything with a lot of teams and Brighton have, have shown that but you know, it just shows you where Chelsea are at at this moment yeah. in time in terms of this is the type of money that they're having to spend to bring you know, Midrich youngsters to the club you know, there is no doubt that Graham Potter has got a job in his hands or the club have got a job in their hands to build the place from you know, the infrastructure um, from within um, to, you know, and then you would hope that maybe Chelsea can look at it and go and get these players for the 10 million pounds. I, mean, so I know we, there's obviously a bracket So what are we saying next season Chelsea could win the title? Putting it out there, no one. Yeah, they've got they've got to be challenging mm. for sure. I, I, yeah. I mean, Clint, we had the debate uh, on Soccer Saturday when you said they have to be challenging for top four, and I thought straight away they're going to give him time. Yeah. I did not expect them to be where they are now. Yeah. So longer term, if it's this time next year, I think he, he moves on. Yeah, yeah. Now, because he's just come in the door, he's taking yeah. time to, to s settle in, bring players in. But definitely next year, you've, definitely. even if they miss out on top four this year, which I don't see them getting anywhere near that at yeah, this moment yeah. in time, but next year, that's the minimum and you've got I to be still, challenging. You know, we touched on that. I still think they need to find a striker from somewhere. I really do. I mean, you, I mean, you look at the top teams and what makes a difference is that main striker. You know, you look at Chelsea at this moment in time, they can have all the possession they want. They can have, you know, the wingers are no doubt as good as anything, but you need to find that central striker. But we all sat here in the summer, didn't we think Aubameyang might, might be that? No, we said, it, no, might think, be a, we said it might be a temporary one because we, we didn't know what was good. Obviously, because Tuchel had, worked under, Tuchel had worked under him. He had worked under Tuchel, sorry. He thought that was a good sign and he could get the best out of him. Then when your manager leaves, you look at Bamia and you think, am I going to get the game time? I think Jao Felix is a good signing. In that short cameo, I saw him against Fulham before he got sent off. Maybe he's the one who could score them the goals. I'm not sure, boy. I just think it, yeah. He, but I think he can yeah, score goals. I think goals. it depends how Graham Potter wants to play as well, doesn't Yeah, it? exactly. So if he wants to play with, like, athletic, mobile forwards then you think what they've got at the minute, the way that Havertz moves, you think the quick, yeah. wide players that they've got. So I suppose it all depends on...
how he wants to play. play. Yeah. It's got to keep everyone happy, Jules. Yeah. He's got one hell of a squad, Graham Potter. Yeah. But you'd rather have that, maybe, wouldn't you, if you're a manager? Yeah, maybe you should phone him and own loan a few to Everton <laughs> to use a smile on your face tonight. Yeah. Uh, all right, thanks, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> really appreciate that. It's, tough enough night. Um, it just, it's strikes me to talk about Everton and make, make a bit of a joke of that. But you know, Liverpool, you know, you're talking about Chelsea spending so many, so much money, 10 points off the Champions League places, too, but spending huge money. Liverpool brought in Cody Gakpo. Liverpool haven't done anything else. Are you surprised they haven't? Pop saying <coughs> now is not the right time. Yeah, to and I think that's sport. the thing with Liverpool, isn't it? I think they, they don't panic by at this point, and I think it's probably just not the right players that they want at this moment in time. But I think with the injury to Canate to yeah. as well, you look at the, the two centre halves that they've got, you know, Gomez, Matip. I know that Phillips was going to go out on loan, probably he'll stay now. But yeah, it's the injury problems with Liverpool um, at the moment. I know it's, Liverpool fans. They've even got that midfielder who they brought in, Arthur, who still he hasn't yeah. even kicked yeah. a ball yeah, yet. He's been injured. And so They've had no luck in that midfield. And I thought maybe the hierarchy would have backed Jurgen Klopp, but maybe they're thinking now we'll go again next yeah, season. Summer, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, we've seen some of the transfers <laughs> that went through right now, the prices as well. They yeah. can, you know, there's a few million, you speak about Chelsea, a few yeah, million. Yeah. But play, teams don't want to lose the players at this moment in time either. So I don't think you're getting a true uh, reading of what the players are worth yeah, or yeah. what they are at this moment in time. I think the summer transfer window gives you, you know, a lot of, or a better opportunity to get players in for their actual, um, you know, probably the right fee. Um, and that's why I think Liverpool are, you know, They'll be bit hesitant just, to go and yeah. spend some money. But it's just, you know, you, you kind of look at it. I'm sure Jurgen Klopp will say the exact same thing, that you feel as if Liverpool, the bad luck has all came at once, whether it's injuries or, you know, the dip in form. The summer's a massive transfer window yeah. for, for Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool, and I'm sure they'll get it right. He's done it yeah, before. They'll be challenging Jules next season. I'll pull it out there. But, but Michael, how big does that rebuild? Yeah, everybody challenging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how big does that rebuild need to be in the summer? Is it just about the midfield? Is that what they target, or is it bigger than that? Um, I think when you think <clears throat> Jota comes back, Diaz comes yeah. back, I mean, they've, they've had so much unlooked luckiness this year with injuries yeah, yeah. I think the midfield now it's aging we talked about that I mean I look for, for Jude Bellingham and I talk about Liverpool I just keep thinking are they saving all the money we're going to go right okay. this is it we're going to plump everything into it yeah. whatever it costs 120, 130 million pound I'm not too sure because I think everyone will be in the market for him but I think for Liverpool they have to change that midfield you look at the two full backs OK, they're not having the greatest of season but they're there for the longer yeah, term yeah. in my yeah, opinion th- you, you're, you're right there because you know, there's a lot of teams who look at you know the, the two forward players, the two fullbacks, and everybody speaks. With. But Liverpool, the way they play, the midfield two, three, whatever it may be, Covered are it. crucial to yeah, what yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. You know, to allow the fullbacks to go and do, yeah. to allow the the, the centre backs to split and get on the ball, to allow the, full, the the wingers to go and play. You know, higher up the pitch and come in, and the striker will drop down. And it sounds easy sitting here saying it, doesn't <laughs> it? But um, you know, I'm sure when you look at you know Liverpool over the years, the way they've clicked under Jurgen Klopp as well. The key part of it is that midfield area. They need legs in there. Jude Bellingham's the one that's been mentioned. You know, an unbelievable talent. It's going to be a lot of money, but I think it could be money well spent. you transform that Liverpool side? He'll need help. I think they're probably looking at another one or two in there. But, you know, there's one thing about Liverpool. I don't think, you know, if they go and spend, you said, what, 130, 40, 50 million it might be. And obviously the the Fernandes deal's not going to help that at this moment in time either. He transforms any midfielder. I am with you. He he, he transforms any midfielder kid. But he needs needs, needs someone else in there with him as well. No, he does, but what George said, he will transform Liverpool. You are right, they do need someone else, but he'll transform any team. Any team that gets Jude Bellingham will be really lucky. He's a super talented individual. It has been a quiet day for Liverpool on deadline day. Just to recap the news that we broke in the last five, ten minutes or so, that Pedro Porro has finally signed for uh, Tottenham from Sporting. They've confirmed it is a loan deal until the end of the season with an obligation to make the deal permanent in the summer. And uh, Spurs fans wanted to get his uh, number on the back of the shirt. He'll be number 23, Porro. He has signed for Tottenham on the day uh, Doherty left the club. So, Wow. Look at the time. Uh, Time to call last orders in this transfer window. Certainly no dry January in the Premier League. Todd Bowley got the rounds in at Chelsea. Lots of them. Uh, About to break the British record for Enzo Fernandes. Mudrick gave Arsenal the eye, but he ended up in Chelsea's arms. Manchester United hoped Gakpo was a match, but Liverpool muscled in. Dan Juma couldn't resist Tottenham's advances, snatching him from under Everton's nose. They got a new manager. So far, though, not a single new signing. Uh, Ronaldo finally got his move with help from Mr Morgan. Anthony Gordon got his way too. Moises Caicedo didn't. Plenty of surprises too. Cancelo to Bayern. Jorginho to Arsenal. Verkhorst to United. Doherty's Spurs contract torn up tonight. 
expect the unexpected. It was the biggest January spend ever, and while some clubs toast a successful window, others are drowning their sorrows. But now, it is 11 o'clock nearly. The bell's about to ring. It is time, everyone, please. Haven't you all got homes to go to? We've got to start clearing up here. <laughs> um, the highest spending January transfer window ever. More still to be spent because, of course, deals always come in after 11 o'clock. Spending this season by Premier League clubs, including the summer, is at around £2.5 billion. But some of the biggest deals of the night are not yet done. Enzo Fernandez on the cards but not confirmed to Chelsea. Pedro Porro just confirmed in the last few minutes to Spurs. Marcel Sabitzer to Manchester United, not yet confirmed. It's very worth staying with us. Whoever you support, deals can still happen. We'll get the panel's thoughts on the big stories of the night so far. Uh, and there is breaking news reaching us all the time. We get off straight away this hour to Nottingham Forest. Rob Dorsett, what do you know? Jules, the lights have gone off at Forest Training Ground, but they're still doing business. And as you heard those bongs from Big Ben, we got confirmation that Nottingham Forest have confirmed the signing of John Joe Shelby from Newcastle United. He signed a two-and-a-half-year deal for an undisclosed fee. That is one done deal for Nottingham Forest. Just over an hour ago, we told you that Felipe, the Brazilian centre-back, 33 years old, he'd completed his move uh, from Atletico Madrid. He signed a one-and-a-half-year contract. We wait to hear about the Paris Saint-Germain goalkeeper, Kayla Navas. Forrest believe they registered him in time. They believe they got the paperwork in time before that 11 o'clock deadline. But did they? Are the Premier League happy with his registration? We wait to hear. Two down for Forrest, one to go. Don't go anywhere. Rob, we wait to hear what happens with Navas. 26 and 27 signings okay. of the season in for Nottingham Forest. I should, I should come to the former Forest players, shouldn't I? Michael Dawson, um, Felipe in, and John Joe Shelby. I heard Paul Merson earlier on absolutely raving about him. Mm. If you keep him fit, he could be a real game changer for Nottingham Forest. Do you rate him that highly? Yeah, very highly. And very experienced Premier League player. That's going to be the problem. Can we get him up to scratch, up to speed as quick as possible? Because he hasn't played much football this season for Newcastle. So that, that's going to be, be the problem. But a no-brainer, good, good signing for them. Experience. Felipe coming in. Uh, uh, an old head, you can say, at 33, played in Champions League for Atletico. I think that's a very, very good sign. And Chris Wood as well. I, th I think the work they've done again, they did big business in, in the summer, over 20 signings, and now they've gone and sourced players. It wouldn't surprise me if something still happened in a goalkeeper. I know they were still trying to do something like that because of the injury to, to Dean Henderson. Whether it'll happen, whether that's in the process now, I'm not too sure, but that'll be something that... They'll be probably disappointed if they don't get him over the line because I think he's going to be out for, for quite a while. But the work they've done, Scarper and, and Danilo, good signings from Nottingham Forest. Very positive window. Sounds like a bit of breaking news, though, doesn't it? Teaser, wasn't it? No, it was no teaser. teaser. Just teaser. <laughs> I've been listening all day thinking that, that's something they <laughs> listen at Raw. Um, and it sounds like he's not played Navas at PSG, 36 years old. And, and you think, could this happen? Even even still, it's maybe going on. Only time will tell. But I don't like having that. Hey, there they are. They'll, they'll, they'll give you the proper news, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> He's waving at Vicky and Darmesh. Dons, over Dons, the, no, the no, other uh, side of the studio. <laughs> and I think that's where we're going next. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, Vicky, you're going to give us some proper news, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to give it. Me and Dharma are going to not speak, but Ben Ransom can give us some news. Let's get a little bit more then, Ben, who's uh, been at Manchester United all day for us. So what can you tell us about this man, Sabitzer? Did this deal get over the line? 
I can tell you I have literally just spoken to someone senior here at Manchester United who tells me the deal sheet was in before the 11 o'clock deadline. So Manchester United now have one hour until the international registration deadline essentially uh, goes by to get this completely finalised. The club believe they're on course to get this deal done. The deal sheet was in. Sabitz has been here now for a number of hours. We saw him land and arrive here around 20 past eight this evening. He's been inside the first team building here. He's had a medical, he's done the press photography bits, he's sat there and sorted the final bits of his contract and the club crucially have agreed that loan deal until the end of the season. The deal sheet's in, we're just waiting now for official confirmation. Through the deal sheet situation with you in a moment, just hold your horses though, because I'm going to go to Paul Gilmore, who's at Stamford Bridge, and he can tell us the latest on Enzo Fernandez, this record, British record transfer. This deal has been agreed in principle. Did they get their deal sheet in, do you think? That's what they're waiting on at the moment, Vicky. Everything in place. They've done the difficult part. They've all come to an agreement on this British record transfer, £105 million. Pounds. And the difficult bit was to sort out the structure of the payments and how they were going to do that. Well, they did that with the not long left of the window, and that resulted in a frantic bid to fill in the paperwork and make sure that gets in in time. I'd be stunned if it didn't, but until it's officially confirmed and that's what we're waiting on, uh, Enzo Fernandez will still be talked about as a Benfica player, but realistically, he's coming to the Premier League, he's coming to Chelsea, he's coming as a World Cup winner and uh, we're expecting him in, providing everything's fine with that, into the UK tomorrow morning. Early indications from Portugal suggest he will sign a contract until 2031, which fits with um, the Chelsea ownership's ambition to bring in some of the best young players, to rejuvenate, to excite the fans here at Stamford Bridge and really um, put Chelsea in good stead for the coming seasons and really turn them into real challengers again on all fronts. Not that they were, they won the Champions League just two years ago of course, but uh, that's what the plan is and uh, it's all coming together and Enzo Fernandez is the latest part of that. Thank you very much, Paul Gilmore. And as I said, Damesh, you're going to explain the kind of deal sheet situation if anyone's just joining us and worried that their signing didn't get over the line. Yeah, Ben Ransom was explaining it a bit there. Basically what happens is if a club feels that they're going to get everything done, but not by the 11 o'clock deadline. As long as they've got the player registered, they have to put in a deal sheet between 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. There's a two-hour window. Okay. And if they get that deal sheet in with all the relevant signatures from the player and both clubs on that deal sheet within that time, then they're given a further two hours to finalise that deal if it's a domestic transfer. And as Ben was explaining there, if it involves a foreign player from another league, yeah. then the FIFA transfer matching system is midnight. That's the deadline for that. Now, I'm told that there are a fair few deal sheets in. OK. By, by the Premier League won't give us an exact number and they definitely won't give us names, but we're trying to find out which of these players are subject of a deal sheet. We know from Ben Ransom that Marcel Sabitzer is one of the deal sheets. I'm led to believe that the Cedric Suarez deal required a deal sheet. They're just finalising that deal from Arsenal to Fulham for the right back on loan for the rest of the season. And we're just waiting to find out about this big Enzo Fernandez deal as well. Just because a club hasn't announced a deal, they could well have done everything be before 11 o'clock. So you could put in a deal sheet, say, I don't know, 8 o'clock in the evening? No. 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 Ah, OK. It has to be between 9 o'clock in the evening and 11 o'clock. Right. You have a two-hour window to be able to do that. You can't do it before, you can't do it after. Within that time frame, if it goes in then, then you've got that extra time just to finish off that So potentially deal. you could have, like, three or four players on deal sheets and you just put them in between 9 and 11 and then you kind of, like, do the business yeah. sort of after 11. But the thing is... To have the deal sheet in, You've got to you, you're going to have to have the requirement and the signatures of both clubs and the player involved as well. Okay. It, it can't just be something, oh, let's just try yeah. our luck and see if we can get it done and give ourselves an extra hour or two. But it needs to be done within that time frame. So there are a fair few. We're trying to find out exactly who. Enzo Fernandez might not even be on a deal sheet just because it hasn't been announced. They could have sorted everything out and given the paperwork in, but we're just waiting for an announcement. Okay. So it's not necessarily a deal sheet for Enzo Fernandez. But you think it was because this was quite a difficult one to get kind of. It was, but then Carvey was saying that when he was 
breaking that the deal had been agreed. Mm. He said that it had actually been agreed an hour before. So who's to say everything was done before 11 o'clock anyway? We shall see. Well, how long are you going to take to find out who the people are on the deal sheet then? Uh, another hour or so. <laughs> Hurry up. The window's closed, if you didn't already know, but there are plenty of potential deals that we're still waiting for. But a reminder of the big news that came out of Tottenham. They have signed Pedro Porro from Sporting. Stay with us.